Good morning, everyone. Greetings, um, all colleagues around the world. Um, thank you so much for your interest in today's event. Um, I would like to um, describe the, what's the Glowita all about very briefly for those who haven't met us yet. Uh, I'm Tamara. I am the project manager of the Glowita Partnership Project I'm with IMO team in London. Uh, we have Ada also on the call, on the team, who is supporting us. And um, today's event is part of the uh, our training programs that we are conducting online virtually to make sure we reach out to um, as many participants as possible. Glolita Partnership Project started in 2020, and it was seed funded by the government of Norway. And is uh, the project is implemented by IMO and FAO together. Uh, today's event, as um, Ada mentioned, uh, is uh, interpreted into French language. Uh, the same event will take place tomorrow, but a different time. We wanted to make sure that uh, our colleagues and partners around the world could join a different time zone that are convenient uh, for them. And um, I hope you manage to switch to interpretation if you need to. The event will be recorded. If you have any objections, please let us know. But that's for the purpose of um, enabling uh, other participants that were not able to attend or can attend only partially, being able to come back and listen um, to the recording. Uh, the I, uh, the um, event today is conducted by uh, Mr. Peter van den Dries. He is our international consultants um, expert on port reception facilities in general sea-based marine plastic litter. And he is the author of the guidance on how to develop port waste management plan, among other uh, guidance documents produced by under the Global Litter Partnership Project. We shared with you this uh, guidance document before, but it is easily accessible online. And I will ask Ada to drop the link um, in the chat. We also have this uh, Peter's uh, PowerPoint presentation translated in French that will be also shared to, with you for future uh, reference. Um, we expect that this <clears throat> training, um, during this training, uh, our partner countries, the representatives of maritime and uh, fishing industry, gain enough knowledge to be able to share this knowledge later on with their colleagues and other stakeholders in the country, uh, as well as in the region. I would also like to um, emphasize that we shared with you a survey uh, last week to fill out to uh, understand better general knowledge um, on the issues that we're discussing today. We're also be sharing a uh, similar survey after this event to see how much um, advanced uh, the knowledge advanced after the seminar. That's only for our records. It will not be shared with anyone. We just want to keep the database and see how we improve and support advancing knowledge uh, regionally and globally. Thank you so much. With, uh, without further ado, um, Ada, do you have any other logistical points to emphasize or we can um, let Peter start? We can working? let Peter start. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck. Enjoy the webinar. Uh, the pleasure of meeting you to see everyone online. Peter, floor is yours. Thank you. You are muted, Peter. Okay, this should be better now. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Ada. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, so uh, my name is Peter van den Dries, and uh, I uh, um, I will try to uh, guide you today or talk you to through the 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 guidelines or the the guidance manual that was already developed uh regarding the de the development of uh, port waste management plans 
Uh, I will briefly introduce myself. So I work actually as a, a policy advisor for the uh, environmental uh, administration in uh, the Flanders region of Belgium. Uh, and I am, have been dealing with waste from ships for, for many years. Uh, uh, I also work as an independent consultant, uh, mainly for the IMO. Uh, and before uh, this, I have worked as a technical environmental manager for the Port of Antwerp Authority. And before that, I was project officer at the European Maritime Safety Agency. Uh, oh, yes, I will try to speak slowly for the uh, interpreters. If I go too fast, please uh, interrupt me. Just uh, let me know. Um, and I will share my screen. This should be okay. Ada, is it okay? No? Hmm. We'll try again. No, that's fine. That's fine, Peter. It was okay. Ah, Go back. It was yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a slow uh, transmission. Just, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. So, yes, we have uh, four hours in principle. Um, it's always a bit exciting. It's the first time this uh, this uh, webinar on uh, port waste management plans. So, um, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, actually, I uh, divided this webinar into four, let's say, four main parts. Uh, the, the first part is, well, more or less setting the scene. So I, I will talk about uh, waste from ships as a source of marine litter, uh, about adequacy of port reception facilities, etc. Because I really think it is important to have a good understanding why this is so important, this, uh, this uh, collection of, uh, of waste from ships. Uh, and and the adequacy ensuring adequacy of uh, waste reception facilities. The second part is uh, the the uh, like an introduction to port waste management plans. Uh, what is a port waste management plan? Uh, uh, something about legal and policy framework. Um, and very briefly, uh, a slide on the management of plastic waste specifically. Uh, we plan to have a short break, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, depending on where we are uh, with the timing. The third part uh, is uh, I, I will uh, guide you through the, the key elements of a port waste management plan, why they are there, how to uh, get information, etc. And then the final part of the webinar is about related processes. Uh, other policy manager measures, uh, approval process, uh, some models of port waste management plans. I will also explain that to you. And we foresee some time for questions and answers. Maybe I saw on the first slide, the, the introductory slide, that we can have two uh, Q&A sessions very shortly, maybe one before the break, and then uh, another one uh, at the end of the, of the webinar. Okay, this was already actually introduced by uh, Tamara, so we can skip this and then start with uh, what is marine litter, because we, we talk about it all the time, but we are not always sure what it is. So I looked up the, uh, the definition that was uh, developed by the, by the UN. So marine litter is any persistent manufactured or processed solid material discarded, disposed of, or abandoned in the marine and coastal environment. So actually, marine litter can be anything. It can be, uh, well, you have some pictures there, some examples on the screen. 
uh, it can be uh, an, an old uh, recreational boat that has been washed up on shore. Uh, of course, lots of plastic items, an old buoy that, uh, that is uh, floating around, even uh, uh, some parts of, uh, or from rockets that uh, fall from the, the space uh, into the ocean. So it's, it's really diverse, it can be, uh, it can be everything. And where do we find this uh, this marine litter? Because if if you would ask someone to to to, what, to explain what is marine litter, then everyone, I guess, would say, well, it's the 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 debris that that floats upon the the ocean surface. Um, but actually, it's 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 the, the minority of uh, of the, the the amount of waste uh, in in marine litter. It's actually only between 0.5 and 15% of total marine litter that is floating upon the ocean. Um, and, and another part of the marine litter is floating in the water cone. And actually the majority of marine litter is on the seabed. So that's a bit surprising uh, for, for many people, but actually the, the majority is uh, on the ocean's floor. And of course, that depends on the density of uh, the marine litter because, well, of course, uh, I can already <laughs> say that the majority of the marine litter is plastic. Uh, and, and everyone thinks that plastic always floats, but that is not the case because there are a lot of uh, types of uh, plastic that have a density which is uh, higher than the seawater density. So as a result, it, uh, it either floats in the water column or sinks to the, the ocean. And there are some uh, to, to the ocean's floor. And, and I give you some, some examples here, um, like cigarette butts, for example. It's, it's a bit surprising, but they have a density which is higher than the, the seawater. So it, uh, it doesn't stay on the surface. Uh, polyethylene. Uh, turf tallate, uh, uh, which is quite heavy. So uh, you, you saw the previous slide with all the, the bottles on, on the ocean's floor here. So that is uh, uh, PET, uh, P-E-T. And, and there are many examples. Fishing gear uh, also is uh, heavy, more heavy than uh, seawater. So it, uh, and this also has a, a, a huge impact, which I will show you later as well. So there's a lot of debris, debris uh, floating and, and, and uh, in the water column. So what happens then is uh, then we come to the so-called plastic soup. You probably you have heard uh, about this uh, already. So of course the earth is, uh, is turning and then you have also the, uh, the, the, the currents in the ocean and the prevailing winds and so on. So actually this works as a, a giant, uh, how do you call this? Uh, like, um, so all, all the, the plastic waste is being sucked in, in to, to the same area. Uh, for example, this one here in the Pacific Ocean, it's, it's a well-known uh, garbage patch. It was actually the first garbage patch that was uh, discovered on, uh, on, in our oceans. So you have all the thing, all the all the debris is uh, coming together in the middle of this uh, of this patch here, um, and in fact the the name or the terminology plastic soup is 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 very well chosen uh, because if if you look at all these uh, these these patches, there's really like a. Um, like a soup, really. The, lots of small pieces, some bigger pieces. Some are on the surface. Some are uh, a little bit below the surface. So it's really very well chosen, actually. So I was told that um, if you would sail through a, a garbage patch, uh, the, like this plastic soup patch, then you would not see it. But if you would swim in it, then it would look more or less like this, really. So it's a uh, it's, it's some people have an idea like these patches are giant islands where you can walk upon, uh, but that is definitely not uh, the case. So this is more like it really. Um, 
Peter, I sorry, have... could you just just a little bit slower, just tiny okay. bit. No, you are doing <laughs> excellently. Just tiny yeah. bit slow. Just just to yes. have a break between the sentences. Just sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank no, you, thank... no, no, no problem. I will. <laughs> thank... I'm sorry, in interpreters. Thank Sometimes you. I, I get a, a little bit carried away in my enthusiasm, uh, and I will. I, I start uh, speaking uh, uh, quicker. So I will slow down a little bit. Uh, so uh, talking about data on uh, marine litter, of course, this is extremely difficult. Uh, we don't have exact scientific data on, um, on marine litter, but we do have estimates. So um, if there are estimates that worldwide, there is already more or less 200 million tons uh, of waste in our ocean, and that is uh, extremely difficult to imagine, of course. Uh, and every year, uh, there are estimates that 8 to 12 million tons are added, and this equals one garbage truck every minute, uh, every day, every week, every year, one truck per minute. So that's extremely um, concerning, I, uh, I would say. Um, also, in it, it has been found that in some places the sea already contains 26 times more plastics than plankton. And also that is very concerning because plankton is on the bottom of the food chain. So uh, it's, it's really important to, to have this, uh, the, the marine ecosystem uh, and not actually not only the marine uh, ecosystem. And also an, another concerning uh, estimate is that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean uh, by weight than there are fish. So that and 2050 is not so far away. Um, and I already gave it away uh, the uh, majority of uh, marine litter is plastic. These are uh, data from the uh, OSPAR uh, commission in the Northeast Atlantic, but it's uh, this is uh, really uh, representative for the, 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 the global uh, situation. So where does it come from, uh, marine litter? Also here, there are global estimates, 80% uh, it may be a bit surprising in a way, but 80% of marine litter is uh, from land-based sources and 20% from sea-based. But again, this is a global estimate and there are uh, strong regional differences. Uh, and in certain areas, uh, all uh, sea-based sources uh, prevail. Uh, for example, in the North Sea, um, there is, uh, it's more like 50-50. Uh, land-based and sea-based sources. This is a very interesting graph, I think, because uh, this comes from um, a, a large study that was done in uh, 2016 for the European Union. Uh, and, and this uh, graph nicely indicates the different sources uh, of marine litter and also quantifies the, uh, the, the, the sources. So you see here that in total, the, uh, the amount of plastic entering the marine environment is about 12 million tons uh, per year. And you can see here the uh, sea-based sources, actually it's uh, 1.75 million tons. So it's uh, not uh, that much compared with land-based uh, sources. And also, if you look at these sea-based sources, the difference between waste from fishing activities and other shipping activities is also very significant. Uh, fishing uh, activities account for 1.15 million tons and uh, waste from other shipping is almost half of it. So also here, sometimes this is uh, uh, like um, a, a wrong uh, thought that uh, waste from ships is 
in uh, the majority is like bruise, uh, bruising and, and so on. But that is not the case. Actually, from all sea-based sources, fishing activities are the most uh, relevant. Um, yes, also here, this, this slide indicates that the majority here on the seafloor is, well, according to this, uh, um, these data, it's 94% of all uh, marine litter. So really, uh, that, that is really a lot. Um, and also this, um, because you also have heard probably uh, about initiatives that are being taken to, uh, to take out the marine litter from the ocean, for example, the uh, ocean cleanup, that was, that's uh, an initiative taken by a Dutchman uh, boy on slot, uh, and and he has designed these uh, large, uh, like um, uh, how do you see it, devices that float on the ocean and collect the uh, marine litter. And of course, that is a nice initiative, but you, you don't you only catch a very small amount of the the marine litter, and uh, it is extremely difficult to take out the, the marine litter, which is on the seabed. Also, this uh, slide indicates uh, the sources of uh, marine litter. The yellows are uh, land-based and the blue ones are uh, sea-based. So you see here, this is the <clears throat> east uh, eastern part of Asia. This is North America. So you see that uh, in, in Asia, the majority of marine litter more or less is uh, land-based, while if uh, while looking at the uh, West Coast, the North American West Coast, it's more the uh, sea-based sources uh, that prevail. So depending on where you are, that this can uh, this can differ. And then talking about sea-based sources. Um, <laughs> Of course, it can be everything. It can be uh, all types of shipping from the largest vessels to the smallest yards uh, and also offshore activities uh, and aquaculture. It, uh, of course, it's, it's very obvious. Now we will go a little bit more into detail uh, about uh, or into uh, sea-based sources of marine litter. So the first one I, I give you here is container loss. Um, of course, that is something that not uh, that happens not that much, but you will be surprised uh, the, the amount of containers that are lost every year. But when it happens, of course, it's a, a, a major source uh, of marine litter. Um, you see here some pictures of like uh, cigarettes and, and so on and, and other stuff, but also plastic pellets that this is really an issue uh, when it when when we talk about container loss. Uh, I think two or three years ago, there was a vessel uh, in the uh, Sri Lanka seas, uh, which lost some containers and some of them were uh, containing plastic pellets. It's you see here the picture on the uh, uh, on the left below, uh, these plastic nurdles are how how they call them. Sometimes they are used as a a, 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 a source, a, a, a raw material for for the, the the production of plastics. And they you can see here the picture. All this white here, it's it's all the, those beaches were covered in in plastic pellets. Uh, and that was really a major disaster, which, which led also to discussions within the IMO about how or uh, about whether we should strengthen the regulations uh, regarding where to put these uh, containers uh, with plastics, uh, with plastic pellets on the vessel. Uh, there are some, there were some voices or some opinions saying that actually we should regard these plastic pellets like some type of the hazardous material uh, and maybe put the containers with plastic pellets uh, more inside the, the vessels uh, so that they that when the containers fall off uh, that they do not uh, contain these uh, 
these plastic uh, pellets. But these discussions are still ongoing. Here are some data, as I said, uh, it is a bit surprising because if, of course, there were some uh, major disasters like uh, here in 2013 and also in 2020, but in average, every, every year there's about 1000 containers being lost at sea. So that is, uh, in my view, that is surprisingly, uh, a surprisingly high number. Um, Another uh, source uh, or uh, a, a sea base or a shipping uh, source of marine litter is uh, the discharge of uh, cargo or washing waters containing uh, cargo. And also here you have an example, uh, these um, persistent floaters like paraffin, for example, uh, when this, um, it's in, in general, when it is being transported, it's uh, a liquid. But if it is uh, discharged at, uh, at, 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 or in, in, the, in the ocean, then it solidifies. And it's a really uh, a very light, so it can, it can move for, uh, for huge distances. And then you have these, uh, the picture on the right here below, these, uh, these yeah, packages of, of solid material they wash upon uh, the beaches. Um, so we in, in, in Western Europe, uh, especially we, this was a problem for, for many years. Um, and, but the IMO has also uh, tackled this. Uh, and since uh, the beginning of, I think it was 2021, uh, it is no longer allowed to discharge these types of, uh, of uh, cargo or uh, washing water uh, at, uh, at, at sea. So now when a ship transports persistent floaters, then the ship is required after uh, delivering the cargo, the ship is required to do a pre-wash at the port and deliver the, the, the washing waters from these uh, pre-wash to a port reception facility in, in that port. Uh, or the ship is not allowed to to leave the port. Uh, so that, I think that is uh, also a very good uh, initiative. Another type of uh, uh, shipping marine litter is the discharge of garbage. Um, of course, garbage, uh, Marple and NX5, uh, there are very strict uh, discharge requirements uh, in uh, Marple, and I, I will come to do that later as well. But uh, in principle, it, uh, you cannot discharge any garbage unless it is explicitly allowed. And there are only very few uh, types of garbage that can be discharged at sea legally. Um, you see here two pictures. The picture on the left is, uh, this is a, a net that is or was used for, um, uh, for for cargo for uh, uh, keeping the cargo in uh, in place. This picture was taken near Scotland uh, at a depth of uh, one thousand meters. And then the picture here on the right, you see. Well, you can see what it is. It is a a can of uh, of Heineken uh, beer. Well, as a Belgian, we don't think this is beer really, but. Uh, uh, this was this picture was taken in the Gulf of Biscay uh, near France, um, also at a depth of uh, one thousand meter. And this clearly, you see, it's it's not even covered with uh, with algae. So this was as a, almost certainly uh, dropped from uh, a ship. Um, Another type of, uh, of uh, marine litter from ships is uh, actually microplastics, uh, something that is not always uh, the first that comes in, in someone's mind, but uh, microplastics, uh, they, uh, of course, they are in, in shampoo, in, uh, in, in, in um, toothpaste uh, sometimes, and especially on cruise vessels with a lot of uh, people, on board thousands of people 
uh, of course, they, uh, this, uh, these microplastics, they end up in the gray water from the vessel. And there are actually no um, discharge criteria for gray water. So uh, these microplastics, they also end up in the ocean. Um, and even when cruise vessels are equipped with uh, sewage uh, treatment uh, systems, these systems are in general not uh, designed for taking out the, uh, the microplastics. So that is also a relevant source of marine litter. And also from the hull, uh, sometimes paintings, uh, paints, they, they, uh, they also contain microplastics. And of course, they are being released in the, uh, in the ocean. And then finally, uh, I already spoke about uh, fishing activities as a source of uh, marine litter. Uh, this is really an issue. Um, I was also in the GAZAM uh, working group uh, working on the uh, report of uh, sea-based uh, sources of marine litter. And there was, uh, although there's not that much scientific data also for this, but in general, there is this uh, agreement that from all sea-based sources, uh, uh, fishing activities is the most um, the most uh, relevant. So I give you here some figures uh, about fishing gear lost each year. Uh, it's it's estimated that five point seven percent of all fishing nets are being lost. Uh, Eight point six of all uh, percent of all traps are being lost. 29% uh, of all fishing lines, and uh, this is uh, a figure that is also extremely uh, big, 740,000 kilometers in total of fishing line would, would be lost every year, and 14 billion hooks. Um, and when you look at the amount of uh, fishing gear in the total of uh, marine litter, uh, in Europe, we have some data that it is 27% of all beach litter is uh, originating from uh, fishing activities. Uh, in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, 46% of the floating debris would be uh, from fishing. And in the North Pacific, even 90% uh, of the marine debris that uh, was uh, uh, intercepted by longline fishers was ghost gear. So that's really uh, an enormous amount of, uh, of waste. So now we know where it, it comes from. And uh, I have a few slides also on the impact of, uh, of marine litter. Um, to start with, there, there is a substantial socioeconomic impact. You see here some pictures, uh, the, the two above is where uh, fishing gear uh, ends up in the ship's uh, propeller. And uh, that is uh, not only very costly for the ship owner or ship operator to, uh, to repair this, because you need divers and it's, it's not always possible to do that, but uh, it's also very dangerous because a ship uh, on the ocean without any uh, propulsion, that is of course very uh, dangerous. Um, and then uh, another uh, type of socioeconomic impact is, of course, um, when uh, in, in tourist areas, for example, when the, the, the litter washes upon the beaches, of course, tourists don't like that. And it's, it costs a lot of money to clean these, these beaches uh, every day. And, and like this example, where it, it is being done mechanically, that's uh, because... Mm, Beaches are also a very vulnerable uh, ecosystem. And if you clean this with uh, heavy machinery and so on, this really disturbs also the, the ecosystem. Um, and then another example here uh, on the right below is um, when the debris uh, uh, impacts uh, like uh, power stations, for example, uh, where they use uh, water to cool the, the, the facility or, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the engines and so on. So that can also be very dangerous and uh, costly to remove. Another type of impact of uh, marine litter 
can be uh, the uh, distribution of invasive species. Uh, you see here some examples with uh, with mussels uh, connecting to uh, to plastic bottles and and the packaging, and then actually the picture here on the right with the Nike uh, trainer. Uh, this picture was taken here in Belgium on the 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 uh, uh, the, the coast, uh, the the the, in the western part of uh, Belgium. And uh, this is from an organization that collects uh, beach litter. And they found this, this uh, trainer with uh, these types of uh, muscles uh, connected. And they were able to trace this, uh, this shoe. Uh, and actually, it turned out that this shoe was lost on the east coast of the US. So it traveled all the Atlantic uh, to wash up in, uh, in Western Europe. Uh, and you see these mussels in general, in, in principle, they are not uh, indigenous for Western Europe. So they have traveled all the way from the, the uh, west, the east coast of the US to, uh, to Belgium. So this is all clearly an, an example of uh, transfer of, uh, of, uh, of species. And then some very depressing pictures, uh, which you probably have seen also um entanglement that is very typical also for uh for marine litter uh animals they they when they are small they uh, they put their heads into uh marine litter and when they grow well you can see what a, a devastating impact it has on uh, these animals um it's really depressing i, I also think that the the uh, the picture here uh, with the uh, the oyster catcher, the, the bird here. This is really such a stupid uh, example. This uh, this type of bird, they they put their uh, their beaks in the, the the sand to collect food, and this uh, this bird uh, has uh, has had bad luck and uh, had to well died because of. Uh, it, it, it was no longer able to, to collect food. So this is just, uh, and it's not only small animals here, uh, this uh, sperm whale, uh, it's just uh, amazing. There, there are some videos uh, I, I could show you where two uh, sperm whales are uh, with their tails in a, a large fishing net. And uh, this, it's really terrible to see uh, things like this. Another example, it, this is specifically called ghost fishing, uh, because when, of course, fishing gear, fishing nets, when they are lost at sea, uh, they, well, they continue to do what they are designed for, which is catching fish. Uh, and then uh, it, it can happen that small fish are um, or are trapped in these uh, in these nets, and this this then uh, in its turn attracts larger uh, predators, larger fish, and also they get uh, trapped in uh, in the fishing gear. So then you end up with uh, examples like here on the on the slide. It's very depressing, also, I think. Another example of uh, environment in environmental impact of fishing gear is ingestion. Uh, these pictures, uh, they, well, they, they're not photoshopped. Uh, in, I can assure you that, uh, for example, the bird uh, on the right there, a uh, famous picture taken by Chris Jordan. Um, of course, uh, these plastic items, they, they, are, they have nice color and so on. And sometimes animals think it's food. Uh, they eat it and uh, they, they die because Sometimes they eat so much plastic that they, uh, the stomach sends a signal to the brain that it, the, the stomach is full. But of course, uh, there's no, um, there's no, it's not, uh, this, it's not food really. So the animal dies of starvation. Or sometimes the, the, the plastic uh, causes internal uh, wounds and, and bleeding and, and, and so on. So, uh, and another example here on the left, uh, which I uh, wanted to, to show you is small plastic bags, because when they float in the, 
in the water column, these plastic bags, they look like jellyfish. And jellyfish is an important, um, an important type of food for turtles. And turtles cannot see the difference between plastic bags and jellyfish. Uh, and, and they eat it. And for example, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, turtles have been uh, picked as an indicator for uh, plastic contamination. So uh, when uh, there are these monitoring programs where scientists from uh, the European countries uh, bordering the Mediterranean Sea, they monitor the stomach content of these turtles and uh, it also the figures are really amazing because the majority of turtles, they have plastic in their stomach. This is also uh, some uh, pictures that these, uh, this is a, a bird which is feeding its chick with a, a cigarette butt. Also very depressing, I would say. And I apologize for these depressing pictures, but Pictures say more than, uh, than words, so I think it's important. Uh, and then a, a, a last type of impact uh, is uh, so-called smothering. Uh, it's when fishing gear uh, is uh, covering uh, coral, um, and then because of the uh, reduced light and the uh, weight of the fishing gear, uh, the coral reefs, they, they simply die. Okay, uh, another aspect of uh, marine debris is that it stays a long time in the environment. Uh, you have some examples here about uh, different types of uh, plastic and, and other uh, marine litter and how long it stays in the environment. And you see here, for example, uh, these uh, six pack uh, holder, uh, 400 years it stays in the environment. Um, a plastic bottle, 450 years. Of course, these, these are estimates, but still it's really significant. This uh, fishing line, 600 years. Uh, so really, this, uh, this indicates that uh, plastic litter is in the ocean for a really, really long time. So you could say, well, this is a good thing because this gives us a lot of time to collect this, uh, this waste. Uh, unfortunately, there is something which is called, uh, um, it's called, uh, I forgot the, the, the English name, uh, but the macroplastic, so large, larger parts of plastic, they disintegrate and um, they, they disintegrate into smaller pieces because of the ultraviolet uh, uh, radiation and also because it's in the ocean and there's a, also a physical uh, disturbing uh, impact. And these uh, plastic, the, which are like hydrocarbons, but long chains of hydrocarbons, they are being cut in smaller pieces. So actually we, we say that macroplastic is turning into microplastic. So um, this is a good example, I think. You see here a plastic bag uh, for uh, being used in a, in a freezer, uh, for example. And you see here that there are parts missing. Uh, so probably this piece of plastic has been in the, in the ocean for quite some time now. But I would like to rem to uh, you, you to remember that actually these parts they are not uh, not gone they are not disappeared they are just smaller and somewhere else. So these parts have turned into microplastics. They are spreading in in the ocean and it never goes away really. And here I hope it works is a, a small video a short video about plankton. So this is, there are two types of plankton. You have phytoplankton, which are like small plants and zooplankton. And this is zooplankton, small animals. And they feed in the, in the, in the water where, they, so they filter the food from the ocean in, uh, for, as, as a food. 
And what you see here, all these yellow, uh, these green uh, small particles, this is in a, in a, in a laboratory, uh, this is microplastics. And you see here how the, the microplastic moves uh, in, uh, okay, it's a replay, that, that's okay. So the, the, um, the microplastics have been made fluorescent. Plastic, and it's also being uh, collected in, uh, in, in their stomach. Oops. Okay. Oops, next slide. Yeah. So there have been already some studies also about microplastics uh, because the, the plankton, as I said, it's, in, it's on the bottom of the food chain and plankton is being eaten by, uh, by, by small fish or small animals and the small animals are being eaten by bigger animals. So you have some kind of accumulation uh, in, the, in the food chain. And in uh, Belgium, for example, the University of Ghent, they have done a lot of research about seafood because we are very fond of seafood, especially mussels. And it was found that there were uh, um, an average of 190 to 440 microplastics per kilogram of, of, uh, of meat. Uh, so not the shell, but only the, the meat of the, the mussel. Uh, and actually the same is for shrimps. Uh, for oysters, but also in, in other uh, types of seafood, also in fish, for example, microplastics are found uh, everywhere, actually. Um, and what is the impact of the microplastics? We really don't know yet. Um, but what we do know is that animals that contain a lot of plastic uh, in their stomach also contain more chemicals in their tissue. So clearly there is an exchange of, uh, of chemicals between the plastic and the animal. Uh, and we have seen this in birds, we have seen this in fish. So yeah, we can be sure that, uh, and we also have found microplastics in humans. Um, so we know that they, we contain microplastics, but we don't know the, uh, the impact because it's, of course, it's very uh, uh, non-ethical or let's say it's, it's from an ethical side, it's, it's rather complex to do uh, testing on humans. Uh, so we do not know the impact, but also one thing we know is that microplastics really, they attract uh, chemicals because most of the uh, harm, um, harmful chemicals, they are uh, hydrophobic. So uh, the, yeah, I'm a chemist from my, <laughs> uh, I have an academic background in chemistry. So uh, uh, I, I always like to explain this, but these, uh, these, uh, these hazardous chemicals, they don't like the water. When they are in water, they, they, when they have the opportunity to connect to something solid, then they will do so. Microplastics, of course, are very small, but there are a lot of microplastics in the ocean. So it's really a huge surface, a possible surface for hazardous chemicals to connect. So if these microplastics are being ingested, also the, the chemicals, they, uh, they are being ingested. So we have to find out what, uh, what is the impact on, uh, on humans. Okay, so far for the marine litter, uh, I think I think we have we are a little bit over time, but we have still plenty of time, so uh, it should be okay. Now I would like to uh, talk a little bit about why proper ship waste management or port waste management, if you like, uh, why it is so important. Um, because all the when when we try to develop port waste management plans and so on, this is all about having waste from uh, from ships to uh, land-based uh, facilities. And of course, the first important uh, reason uh, is that there is a legal requirement. Uh, there is uh, MARPOL, for example, the uh, International Convention on the Prevention of Pollution from Ships. Uh, 
uh, where there is a, a clear requirement for states to ensure the availability of adequate uh, reception facilities in the ports. Um, there are also, as I explained, rather strict discharge requirements for ships. So there is almost no possibility to discharge garbage at sea. So as a result, uh, it's important that ships have the opportunity to deliver the waste to shore site uh, facility. Uh, and also Marple uh, describes some, uh, some regulations regarding onboard management of, uh, of waste. Um, in addition to Marple, there can also be regional requirements. Uh, for example, the European Union has uh, uh, an, a, a directive on uh, port reception facilities. So in EU uh, member states and, and ports uh, have to meet these uh, strict uh, requirements. Uh, but also regional sea commissions, for example, they can have uh, additional requirements uh, regarding the collection of uh, waste from ships. Also on a national level, there can be requirements. Uh, some countries, they have specific waste strategies, uh, also including uh, waste from ships or water quality objectives, which have an impact on the uh, delivery of waste from ships. Uh, and then finally, also some ports may have uh, specific regulations uh, for example, on segregating uh, different types uh, of waste. So clearly, this uh, from a legal perspective, it is important to, uh, to take this uh, into account. Another reason why this is important, I already explained to you, uh, uh, there is a, a, a substantial uh, impact uh, on the uh, marine environment uh, linked to illegal, and I put illegal between brackets here because, um, as I said, there are very few legal options to discharge uh, waste at sea. So this is a, a, an obvious reason after what we have seen uh, before. A third reason is that um, uh, economic growth should not lead to increased environmental impact. Um, as I said in the introduction, I was a technical environmental manager at the uh, Port of Antwerp Authority here in uh, Belgium. And we also implemented several uh, strategies and, and uh, regulations regarding uh, waste, uh, not only waste from ships, but port waste in general. Uh, and, and in our experience, it turned out that uh, after implementing these, uh, these uh, management practices or regulations, we, we, we saw that a more sustainable port is also a more efficient port. So not only from uh, an environmental or sustainable point of view, this, uh, this waste management is important, but it increased the efficiency of the port in general. What we also have seen the last say 10 or 15 years is that the maritime industry they also have made this uh, this this uh, this switch in mindset really uh, that the sustainability issues and environmental issues they they are really important uh, I, I saw uh, I read a text uh, some time ago that if you look at the uh, output of the the uh, IMO uh, that the majority of uh, of resolutions and and so on they are uh, environmentally oriented and which in let's say 30 years ago for example it was really on safety and security and so on but now this 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 uh, switch has been made for uh, for this uh, sustainability so and we also note that several of the, uh, for example, big shipping lines, uh, the MESC and MSC and so on, they really put an uh, effort to this uh, sustainability aspect. And um, 
when when in Antwerp, for example, we have uh, uh, had uh, these major lines uh, visiting us and really asking, what are you doing as a service for ships uh, regarding sustainability issues? And uh, it's it's really it's not that they that 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 is impacting the traffic so that uh, a ship will not go to a certain port because there are no sustainability services, but it it does have an impact. Uh, so it is it's maybe a bit bold to say, but sustainability can be a new competitive advantage for ports. Uh, so I think it also from a, a port uh, authority's view. This is also something to, to bear in mind. Uh, this, for example, uh, is the uh, European Seaports Organization. They uh, do like this environmental survey every two or three years. And uh, you see here that um, for 2023, 20, you see that ship waste is on number six of the most uh, or let's say the environmental priorities of ports uh, in 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 Europe, but I think it's, uh, it's it it can be transposed generally uh, or worldwide. Um, you see here that ship waste is an important issue. Of course, climate uh, is is in the top. Uh, air quality, energy. These are the the three elements that are really important. Like in the last five years. So it's not a surprise that they are on top, but ship waste is uh, here. And the, also the previous years, ship waste has always been, let's say uh, a priority uh, for, for European ports. Um, and then a, a last reason why I think that uh, proper ship waste management is important is that it is an important step or necessary step in the transition towards a circular economy. Um, with, this, with the circular economy, we, we want to step away from this linear uh, approach where you produce material uh, and then end up with uh, something that you dispose of. So uh, instead, the circular economy tries to uh, recycle and reuse uh, the, 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 the material at least and waste it can be seen as a resource of uh, raw materials. It, it is a, a complex resource, of course, but it is a, a resource, a valuable uh, resource of, uh, of raw materials. So if you look at ship's waste, uh, at garbage here, uh, these, uh, this graph here uh, is from uh, also the port of Antwerp. Uh, this, it, this is the composition of the garbage that has been delivered to port reception facility. And the gray area here is uh, plastic. And in principle, plastic can be recycled uh, rather easily, um, as long as it is not, uh, the mixture is not too complex. Uh, so that is a potential source of, uh, of raw material. And the blue uh, amount here, is mixed waste. So I can imagine that there is a lot of plastic in, in that uh, uh, amount as well. So if we could take it out there, then and uh, it, it can be uh, recycled. But not only plastics, of course, also paper can be recycled easily, metals, and e even e-waste. So also this uh, is uh, 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 why I think it is important to uh, take this in, in consideration. Then finally, in this uh, first part uh, is about I'm adequacy. I'm sorry, Peter. I'm sorry, yes. Peter. Is the interpretation okay? Because I can't hear French. Uh, I'm sorry. Is interpretation okay? I can't hear French. Ada? I just heard, uh, I just listened in. I don't hear them either. Bonjour, est-ce que vous êtes là? Euh, oui. Ok, parce qu'en fait, on ne vous a pas encore, on vous a pas entendu. D'accord, ok, bien. Ok, pas de souci. Yes, okay. it's functioning now. 
Um, I switched to French and I can't hear it. Oui, okay. oui, je, moi, je vous entends. Okay, now it's working. Thank you, sorry. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, yes, I was uh, talking about uh, ensuring adequacy. Uh, so, of course, when we start talking about port reception facilities, port reception facility can, in principle, be any facility uh, it can be fixed, floating, or mobile, and it should be capable of providing the service of receiving uh, waste from ships. So it can be, in, in, in practice, it's um, mainly done by a mobile uh, reception facility, a barge or a truck, or a fixed. And both uh, have uh, pros uh, and, and cons. For example, a mobile facility, a truck, is relatively cheap. Uh, it's uh, you can you can uh, you can uh, travel from uh, one side of the port to to another very quickly, uh, but the downside is that in general trucks do not have a big capacity. For example, when it comes to the collection of liquid oily waste, sludge or bilges, then uh, sometimes you need more than one uh, truck or more than one collection from. Uh, the ship. A barge, for example, is more expensive, but has larger uh, storage capacity. A uh, fixed facility, well, that is, should not all, should not be expensive also, if you use skips, for example, and I will give you a lot of pictures, uh, a lot of examples now uh, about port reception facilities, but uh, fixed facilities, they are to be located on a strategic place in the port because ships will not make a transfer from one case site to, an, to, to the facility only to deliver the waste. So that is also very important. And what is an adequate facility? That is, of course, also uh, something where there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, the uh, MARPOL guidelines, they give an indication about adequacy. We, there are uh, uh, guidelines for ensuring the adequacy of port waste reception facilities. You have the the, uh, the resolution number there on the slide as well. Uh, so in general, it is fair to say that an adequate facility will uh, or is not to cause an undue delay for the ships that are using the facility, and they have to meet the needs of the ships using the, the facility. Um, in, in general, there is also, uh, I found uh, in the European uh, Directive on Port Reception Facilities, there is also a reference that in order for a reception facility to be adequate, the facility should be available during a ship's visit to the port. For example, when a ship has to wait like half a day for uh, a, a truck to come alongside, that's not really adequate. It should be conveniently located and easy to use. That's what I mentioned when uh, you have a fixed uh, area or fixed facility. Um, it should, the reception facility should cater for all types of waste streams usually entering the port. What uh, this means is that if you are, for example, a, a, a port where, it's of course purely hypothetical, but where 90% of the terminals are uh, doing dry bullock uh, cargo, for example, then you don't need facilities for oil tankers, where you often have a, a lot of liquid oily waste or washing waters containing oil and so on. If you are a fishing port only, then you don't need other facilities for cargo waste and, and etc. So this is also clearly for the ships that are normally using uh, the port. And finally, an, an, an important issue is also that an, um, an, the use of an adequate facility uh, should not cost so much uh, as to present a, dis a disincentive to users. So also the cost issue is very important when it comes to reception facilities. Uh, there's also reference to the 
uh, cost, uh, the reasonable cost in the uh, MARPOL guidelines. So <clears throat> I will give you some examples now, some pictures. This is uh, a reception facility in the port of Antwerp. Uh, this is actually the biggest fixed facility in, in Europe. Uh, you, this was this used to be a dry dock. You can see here on the picture that you have all the storage facilities and treatment facilities located here or built in this, uh, this dry dock. Um, this seemed to be a good idea uh, when this facility was constructed, but now we know that actually it's not that... Uh, that good because there's always uh, some water seeping in or leaking in the uh, this uh, area, and it's very <laughs> difficult to uh, to keep the the the, fa the, the facility uh, so to avoid corrosion uh, and so on. Um, and also, this facility actually uses you can see here on the right. They use the barges to uh, go outside in the port and collect the waste from the ships. So do you see a vessel here? But it's not uh, the case that these vessels, they, they sail to this facility to deliver waste. No, this, is, this vessel is here because this, this facility also does uh, like uh, cleaning of, uh, of cargo holds. So uh, they, they use barges. This is another example in Sweden, in the port of Gothenburg. This is a, a, a also a fixed uh, facility, but you see this is a, not a, that complicated. You only need a few skips or containers uh, or waste bins, uh, and then uh, uh, to make sure that the waste is collected in a dry area uh, to avoid uh, leakage and, uh, and so on. This is another example in, in the port of Antwerp and another facility which is uh, owned by the Port Authority. Actually, this is a facility used for inland navigation. Uh, important here is that uh, this uh, facility can be uh, closed for uh, non, uh, for, for non, uh, not being ships, uh, I mean, because if you would leave this open, there's a lot of littering from uh, other people, uh, and you have here skips and, and containers for non-hazardous waste, and you, you also have a small storage area inside here. This is the, the inside of this facility. This is for um, hazardous waste. So during uh, opening hours, there is always someone here which uh, who collects waste from these vessels and uh, segregates the hazardous uh, types of waste. But when the facility is closed, it can still be used for non-hazardous waste. This is an example in the port of Ostend. You see here also, I'll go to the next slide, only a few skips actually for some of the most uh, available types of uh, garbage. So it's not complicated at all. But what I would like to emphasize here is that these, uh, these skips are located on a lock. So 95% of the vessels that call the port of Ostend, they have to pass this lock. So of course, then there's some time uh, while well, the ship is there, then the crew can deliver the garbage to uh, one of these uh, skips. This... Uh, the picture on the left here is uh, in the port of Bari in the south of Italy, uh, where uh, garbage from cruise vessels is being collected uh, also with a container, which is put there. Uh, and then the, the crew has some time to deliver the waste. And when the ship leaves, the, the container is, uh, is picked up. Here on the right, this is on the Cayman Islands, similar. Uh, they use just uh, one container. Uh, where the waste from the ships is uh, is uh, put, and then the the container is transported to a waste disposal facility, can be an incinerator or a dump site landfill. Uh, this is collect uh, waste uh, or garbage uh, being collected using a barge. Uh, this is also in the port of Antwerp. Uh, you see here different types of uh, garbage that are put 
on this uh, barge. Actually, the uh, the reception facility operator is not very happy with this uh, way because sometimes when there's a lot of wind, for example, it can happen that some uh, sometimes uh, some of the waste falls into the uh, into the, the dock, uh, and that is uh, of course something uh, we don't like. This is another example in the port of Rotterdam. Uh, this is, uh, you can see, this is the same vessel. Uh, this is an, like an open barge, and you have different containers or skips for different types of waste. So what happens when a ship wants to deliver waste, you always have one person from this company, from this reception facility operator, which goes on board of the, the seagoing vessel, and then uh, already does some uh, segregation of uh, waste in different types and actually throws the waste directly from the seagoing vessel into these uh, open uh, containers. This actually, in my view, is, is state-of-the-art uh, waste collection. But of course, we are talking about the port of Rotterdam here, largest port in, uh, in Europe, uh, one of the, the largest port in the world as well. So there's a lot of ships here, I think more than 30,000 ship calls, seagoing uh, ships um, calling this port. So you have a lot of waste here, uh, which makes it more, uh, let's say, this, this really is a business opportunity for private uh, operators. Uh, so yeah, it makes it more so it makes it more easy to um, to do this in a cost efficient way. And of course, this is not always possible in, in every port and it's not always necessary to do so as well, I would say. Um, this is more something similar, I, I would say. This is in the port of Istanbul in, uh, in Turkey. Um, I, I saw this picture somewhere, but I don't have more information about uh, the exact uh, way this is uh, being operated. Uh, this is uh, something we used to have in, uh, in our ports here in Belgium as well. This was a, a small uh, vessel that was used for delivering drinking water to, uh, to ships. Uh, but after that, uh, it was used. You can see here some uh, containers on board uh, this vessel was also used for the collection of uh, garbage, but it's not no longer in use. Um, another example here is uh, a collection by truck. Um, this is a truck used for uh, for sludge, um, and this is the same company. Maybe it's a bit difficult to see, but you see here a barge collecting uh, bilges and and sludge from a, a seagoing vessel. In Antwerp, we have like, um, I would say seven or eight uh, of these, uh, these barges. We have actually two main uh, reception facilities that collect oily waste from ships uh, using a barge. And then finally, some examples in fishing ports, because I yeah, remember fishing, uh, fishing activities are the most relevant sources of, uh, or sea-based sources of uh, marine litter. Uh, the picture on the left is in the Netherlands. You see some skips here um, that are being used. This picture uh, is in the south of Italy, um, in Sicily, some of the small islands in the, area of Sicily. Also here you see there's really not much that you need um, for collecting waste from fishing vessels, a few containers, and uh, even sometimes the fishing gear is just put on the, the gay side. Um, for fishing ports, uh, there's one more slide here. Uh, this is in Norway, in uh, the port of Tromsø, uh, close to the, uh, the Arctic uh, area. So also, this is really a large fishing port, but you again, you see there's not much. There's one container here specifically for other types of garbage, and this container is for fishing gear. Um, so in principle, again, I would emphasize 
port reception facilities do not have to be very complicated or uh, expensive or whatever. And then this is my last slide on port reception facilities, just to give you an example of uh, about the collection of sewage from uh, vessels. This one is in uh, in Helsinki in uh, the, in Finland, where uh, of course these uh, these ports in the Baltic area they uh, they have a lot of passenger traffic. Uh, so uh, what in general what uh, happens there is that the ships they connect directly to the the sewer system of the uh, municipality. So they just pump out the system direct the uh, the sewage directly into the uh, the, the, the sewage uh, system of the uh, the municipality. So okay, this is uh, this has been my last slide on the first part. Do we go on with the second part immediately, or do we have a very short Q and A? We can maybe have should... Q and A. Yeah. Maybe maybe shall we have a couple of minutes Q and A? Yeah, if there are so if there are questions, please uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm I've stopped. No questions, then I shall continue with the second part. Um, part two. Okay, now I hope you can see the screen. Is it okay, Ada? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the second part, now we go really into port waste management planning. Um, so a, a, a slide on port on, on waste management planning in general, because in uh, uh, the, the use of waste management plans is, is something that has been doing uh, for several years already, uh, mainly in uh, land-based uh, operations. Uh, I think the like the the, the uh, common use of of waste plants, waste management plants, started in the eighties and really uh, started to being used in in the nineties. So uh, I started uh, my uh, my career in the. Uh, the, the, the Flemish Waste Agency in uh, 1994. And at that time, there was a, a, a really large amount of uh, waste management plans that were being developed for all types of waste in municipalities, in industry, in chemical industry. Uh, so really, it, that, that was the start, uh, I think, uh, for the, 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 the waste management plan as a tool for improving uh, practices uh, regarding waste. Um, yeah, these waste management plans obviously play a key role in achieving sustainable waste management, that this has been the clearly the experience in uh, land-based operations, but also, and, and I will come back to that later, also for uh, ships waste and, and, and the uh, management of waste in ports. Um, so in a broad sense, uh, a waste management plan provides a framework for uh, compliance with waste poli policy in general, uh, also target achievement uh, for stock taking of waste and capacity for managing it. So how much waste, how are we dealing with it, uh, how is it being uh, disposed of, etc. Uh, the need to outline the need uh, and, and, and future uh, development. So. Uh, do we have sufficient waste facilities? Um, do we have sufficient sufficient recycling capacity, for example? Uh, and also uh, to uh, provide a framework when it comes to information on general waste management policies and technological measures. So these are like the four pillars in general uh, for waste management planning. And th they can, of course, be supplemented with optional uh, elements and I give you three three examples here uh, waste prevention programs which is 
becoming more and more uh, important. Also the, the link with the structural economy and so on. Uh, organizational aspects um, and uh, awareness uh, campaigns. And for port waste management planning specifically, uh, there, there are these, uh, I, I explained already the MARPOL uh, convention. So for port states, there are uh, requirements to ensure the provision of adequate uh, reception facilities that are, of course, as I said, uh, to meet the needs of the, the users, the users from large vessels to, to very small vessels and without causing undue delay. Uh, in, in general, ports and terminals uh, may also have to meet national, regional and or local regulations, uh, as I said. So that can also have an, an impact on the, uh, the use and the operation of the reception facilities and the collection of waste. And there can also be an impact uh, of national waste strategies, for example, uh, prevention requirements or uh, specific targets for recycling, for example. So all these elements, they impact ports, they impact waste uh, operators in the port, uh, they impact the collection of waste from ships. So therefore, a port waste management plan really is a useful tool to improve the adequacy of port reception facility. Um, to begin with, a port waste management plan can uh, collect all the relevant information that is uh, linked to the collection and the treatment of waste from ships. So you can, in a, in a port waste management plan, you can bring all the information uh, together. Um, another issue is that ports are very different. Uh, no, no port is uh, is the same to to another one. I always use uh, something that uh, Dr. Chris Woodridge from the uh, Cardiff University in the UK uh, said, and uh, I thought it was very. Uh, I always remember that he said, "If you have seen one port, you have seen one port because they are all so different." Uh, and of of course, this also. Uh, has a result that the waste management in a port uh, is uh, very different. So you can design a port waste management plan really uh, tailor-made for uh, taking into account the characteristics of, uh, of your port. Uh, and then a third element, which is extremely important, is that uh, when developing a waste management plan and not only developing, but when implementing also a port waste management plan, it is important to do this in consultation with all the stakeholders, because the stakeholders uh, can be private stakeholders, can be other authorities or uh, whatever, or NGOs. or uh, So they all have uh, very useful and up-to-date uh, information. And that really helps to have a good port waste management plan. Is there a definition? Well, there are several definitions of port waste management plans. Um, when I was uh, writing the, uh, the guidance document, I found several definitions on the internet, but I think this one is really useful uh, because it, it really brings together uh, all the key elements. Uh, and uh, so you see it here, a port waste management plan is a document produced by a port or terminal. So this is uh, important. It's really the, the key stakeholder that is to draft the, uh, the port waste management plan, not some ministry somewhere far away. Uh, the plan unifies the policy on waste reception facilities for ships. That is uh, clear, I, I think, and outlines the facilities available at the location. This is an important element, of course, the, that you when you open or read a port waste management plan, uh, one of the key elements is a list or an overview of facilities that are available. This port waste management plan should demonstrate that ports and terminals fulfill all the requirements 
the, the legal requirements uh, of local, national, regional, or international regulations. This is also clear that the, the port can demonstrate that all these requirements are uh, being met. Uh, and the facilities and infrastructure are to meet the needs of vessels normally using the port without causing undue delays. This is, of course, the adequacy uh, issue that we also talked about. Uh, it's not, uh, again, emphasizing that the Marple requirement is to ensure the availability not of facilities, but of adequate facilities. So this adequacy is really uh, a key element. So it should not come as a surprise that the main purpose of a port waste management plan is to improve uh, availability, adequacy, and usage of port reception facilities for waste from ships normally calling the port. The, the, the word usage is also very important here. Um, re remember, MARPOL has a requirement for states to ensure the availability of uh, uh, reception facilities, adequate uh, reception facilities. But there's, in, there's no explicit requirement in, in MARPOL for ships using these facilities. Of course, there's this implicit requirement because the discharge criteria are very strict. So as if, if a ship is not allowed to discharge at sea, then as a, a, a consequence, of course, it will have to deliver it to a reception facility on shore. But it's not it's this explicit in Marple. So that's why also the usage is uh, very important. And there are some important tools that can uh, enhance the uh, usage of a reception facility. For example, the use of a fee system or uh, the use of an advanced notification uh, system, but I will come back to that in the next uh, part. Um, yeah, well, in addition to this uh, availability, adequacy and usage, usage of the reception facility, there are uh, the possibilities to implement uh, the requirements and goals from national waste management strategies, um, if there are, if they are available. Um, it's, of course, it's not always the case, but uh, um, the the plan can also translate the goals regarding waste management, uh, including the transition towards a circular economy, as I uh, already explained, specifically for the practices in the port and for the practices relating to waste uh, from ships. And in, in a broad sense, also the port waste management plan can work as a, a guidance document or like a full compendium even uh, for all port users and stakeholders where you can have all the relevant procedures, all the information, et cetera, et cetera in a guidance doc in this uh, port waste management plan. So really as uh, the most, uh, uh, the, the broadest way to, to, to see this uh, plan, uh, not only as something you have to produce because it's a requirement in your country or in your port, but really as a useful tool for all port users and stakeholders. Um, yeah, so preferably, of, and of course, in general, when it comes to port waste management planning and everything we are discussing here and everything which is in the, the, the guidance document and so on, this is based on, uh, let's say, general experiences. It's not carved in stone, really. Um, uh, in in EU, uh, we already have this experience for more than 20 years because in our directive, it is a requirement. So we have in not only in Belgium, but all EU countries, we have a lot of experience with developing and implementing port waste management plans. But of course, this is on a, a regional uh, approach. In other parts of the world, um, experiences may be different, but this is in general. So we have seen that port waste management plans really work when they are developed 
uh, in consultation with all relevant stakeholders. This is really what I also explained, um, that uh, this uh, input from the stakeholders is essential, really. Um, also, uh, in our experience, it is useful to have this port waste management plan as a legally binding document. Um, because it, it helps from different sides, not only from the, let's say, national competent authority um, to have this plan implemented, uh, but also from the port authority and all stakeholders, you can, as a port authority, put specific regulations in the plan. If it is a legally binding document, then the users have to comply with these, uh, these elements. And obviously, also, it is important to uh, review the Port Waste Management Plan uh, on a structural uh, basis. So um, we used to have plans every three years or review the plan and, and reapprove the plan every three years. Now this is, has been extended to uh, five years. Um, it's also important to have the information of the Port Waste Management Plan uh, accessible for all the port users. As I said, it is really important to have many stakeholders involved there. So it's also, it's equally important to have the uh, information available to all uh, these uh, port users and especially key information, uh, for example, the list of the port reception facilities, the, the contact details, telephone numbers, email, opening hours, etc. Uh, to have this publicly uh, available. So in, in general, port authorities have the uh, port uh, the port waste management plan on their website. So it can, and some of the information uh, is, uh, is specifically uh, put on, on the website. For example, the, the uh, the contact list of the reception facilities, but also the fee system, for example, uh, or the procedures related to um, advanced notification or uh, waste uh, delivery receipt, etc. And then a third uh, important element uh, when it comes to port waste management planning is that the plan should actually be relevant for all uh, public stakeholders, and I mean um, not only the port authority as such, but all other authorities that are involved with uh, port waste uh, management. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, uh, policymakers within the Maritime Authority, for example, they can uh, find useful information in the port waste management plan. Ship inspectors, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, for example, with the ship inspectors, uh, I mean that uh, we have, for example, a system where ships can be exempt from certain requirements. Uh, for example, frequent callers, ferries, for example, that call the ports every day or, or even uh, uh, multiple times per day. Of course, that they they have different uh, they they require a different approach than other uh, types of vessels. So also, these are elements that can be in the plan, uh, and that ship inspectors can use when targeting ships for inspection. Okay, a few slides on the legal and policy framework. Uh, the, the Marple Convention, really, that is uh, uh, the, the main or the most important uh, convention, in my view, when it comes to um, environmental protection. So this, uh, as I said, the Marple Convention uh, aims at preventing pollution from ships, it's not only uh, accidental, but also operational uh, pollution. Uh, it regulates regulates uh, which types of waste from ships can be legally discharged into the sea. Um, I spoke already about garbage, but falls for uh, oily waste, for example. Uh, Marple has a requirement in general that I think it is 15 parts per million of oil uh, can be discharged legally 
uh, as long as the ship is a, a minimum distance from shore and is sailing at a certain speed and so on, and there is, should be an, uh, a treatment system on board, etc. So that is all in uh, MARPOL. Uh, also, there are guidelines and, and requirements regarding onboard waste management, piping, and etc., and, and the storage tanks and so on. Uh, MARPOL also includes uh, references to enforcement uh, and inspections. And of course, this is uh, said many times, the provision of adequate uh, reception facilities in five of the six technical annexes of uh, MARPOL. Uh, for MARPOL Annex 3, there is no specific uh, uh, requirement regarding port reception facilities. I think this is because if you annex Marple Annex 3 is about hazardous uh, materials that are transported in packaged uh, form, well, the, the, the waste that would uh, be generated from that type of uh, shipping would be like garbage in a way. So this, which is covered by Marple Annex uh, 5. Um, Marple also uh, has uh, many guidelines uh, linked uh, to it, so there are guidelines, so in a way not uh, legally binding, but they work as a, yeah, as, a, as a guidance document on the implementation of uh, Marple. There are also guidelines uh, specifically on uh, adequacy uh, of port reception facilities. And also, I put here uh, the GISIS uh, tool. Uh, GISIS is the uh, Global um, Integrated Shipping Information System, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So that is uh, like an internet-based database, which has been developed by the IMO. And there you really find a lot of information there, a lot of data uh, regarding shipping. Um, there, there is a... Um, information on, uh, on on safety issues on uh, well you can go to the to the geezes there is a, a public area and uh, also an area which is only available for um, for users that have a specific login provided by the maritime administration of the country but also on the uh, open uh, area there's really a lot of information there and also important there the, the GISIS contains a database on port reception facilities so you can browse the database on a port level even uh, and uh, in this uh, this database you can find all the available reception facilities that are available in that port. There's uh, also uh, uh, con contact details and so on. Um, so in principle, if you are a ship operator, you can use this uh, GISIS database to check the, the, uh, the uh, available uh, reception facilities. And what we also see is that in uh, port waste management plans, ports often refer to this uh, GISIS uh, database um, of course, you need to have the information in that uh, database, and there is a requirement in MARPOL that parties are to communicate the information on available port reception facilities into the GISIS uh, system. So this is really a requirement. It's in the MARPOL convention, uh, and, and that is really important because it still happens too much that there is no information available about reception facilities in the ports uh, in the in the GISIS uh, database. So that is really a pity. Um, and also in uh, in the GISIS, there is um, a, a tool where you can um, or it uh, it has a list of reporting of reports of uh, alleged inadequacies of reception facilities. So it's like some type of uh, name and shame, really. Uh, so, in, and there are uh, flag states that consequently uh, report uh, alleged inadequacies. And of course, it's it's not always that uh, this report means that there there is uh, something wrong with the facility. Sometimes it's also a miscommunication. We had that a few times, where, uh, for example, in in uh, one of our ports, the the ship required uh, a waste delivery uh, and there was a miscommunication with the ship agent who ordered uh, a reception facility but for non-hazardous waste and when the the facility went to the ship to collect the waste 
they were also delivering uh, hazardous, uh, some types of hazardous waste. And the reception facility didn't have a permit for the collection of this type of waste. So they said, no, we cannot take this. And then the ship said, oh, this is not adequate and we will make a report. But this is more, <coughs> sorry, this is really an, um, a miscommunication. But it can be that there are no available facilities. Sorry, I need a drink. <coughs> Sorry, I've been speaking a lot. Um, and then, yeah, important to know is that the Marple Convention does not contain an explicit requirement for the development of port waste management plans. So if you are looking into Marple to see what are the requirements for port waste management planning, you will not find any because they are not there. However, of course, uh, in the, let's say, the IMO policy framework, there are several references to port waste management planning. And I, I noted a few of them here, some guidelines. Uh, there is the, the manual on port reception facilities, how to do it. And specifically, The, the IMO action plan to address marine plastic litter from ships, which is quite, quite recent, uh, I think three or four years ago, there is really an explicit reference to uh, consider facilitating the mandatory use of port waste management plans to ensure the provision of adequate waste reception facilities. So clearly this indicates that uh, within IMO, and, and within the IMO uh, parties and uh, flag states and coast, coastal states and so on, they, they, there is an agreement that the use of port waste management plans is facilitating, is facilitating and improving the, uh, the adequacy issue. On an international level, I also wanted to draw your attention to the Basel Convention. Uh, the Basel Convention provides a framework on environmentally sound management of waste, uh, not specifically on waste from ships, but there is also within the Basel Convention a guidance manual on how to improve the sea land interface to make sure that ship's waste or marble waste, uh, once offloaded from a ship, are managed in an environmentally sound manner. You can find this guidance manual there. I, I put uh, the link there. So in general, the Basel Convention is focusing on land-based treatment of uh, different types of waste. But this guidance manual on the interface uh, also uh, explicitly refers to the use of port waste management plans. And then, I, in an international, um, uh, like an international um, uh, event like this, uh, uh, I, I'm often a bit, uh, a bit uh, cautious on referring to uh, EU um, regulations. But in this case, I think it's really necessary because I already referred to uh, and a uh, directive on port reception facilities we have in the EU. Actually, this is the directive uh, 2019 slash 883 is already the second uh, directive on port reception facilities. There was another one in the year 2000. So we have uh, in EU uh, more than 20 years now uh, been implementing regulations on port reception facilities. And this directive, this directive um, aims to protect the marine environment against ne negative effects from discharges of waste from ships using ports by improving the availability and use of adequate reception facilities. <laughs> I apologize, there is a frog in my uh, in my throat. 
and also the delivery of, of waste from ships to those facilities. So this directive applies to all ships, irrespective of the flag, and all EU ports. Of course, it's only applicable to EU ports. And then uh, the key requirements of this directive are uh, to start with, uh, there is a requirement to provide adequate PRF, which is similar to the uh, MARPOL convention. But in addition, there are several more uh, requirements, really mandatory uh, issues that are sometimes have a background in IMO guidelines, not always. For example, the mandatory delivery of all ships waste before leaving the port. So this is clearly uh, what I explained already in Marple. There's no explicit requirement for ships using the facility, but in the EU directive, there is this, uh, it is explicitly there. And I put in principle between brackets because there is a, this uh, exemption when a ship uh, has sufficient storage capacity for the waste that will be deliver, uh, generated during its next voyage, then there is no need to deliver the waste. For example, when a ship sails from, uh, from Antwerp to Rotterdam, well, it's, it's only a short trip. So in principle, if the ship has sufficient capacity, storage capacity, then it does not have to deliver the waste in Antwerp, but can do so in Rotterdam. Uh, there's also a requirement to use the advanced waste notification and waste delivery receipt. This is something that finds its origin in the MARPOL guidelines, the uh, consolidated guidelines. Uh, there is a requirement for having a cost recovery system where the cost for collection and treatment is to be covered by an indirect fee from the ships. So all ships that are calling an EU port have to pay an indirect waste fee. And uh, even if they are not using uh, a reception facility, they still have to pay the fee. This is like an economic incentive. Uh, so you can uh, say that, well, if ships have to pay for the waste uh, anyway, they might as well deliver. So that is the, the idea behind it. Uh, there's the possibility of exemptions for frequent callers. I gave you already the example of ferries. There is an enforcement scheme. Uh, and uh, also in the new directive, there are a lot of requirements for electronic reporting to exchange data uh, with several databases and so on. And an important uh, requirement also here is that every port needs to have a port waste management plan following consultation with all relevant stakeholders. And it is to be evaluated and approved by the competent authority. So that's why I think it is important to refer to this EU directive. And if we look at the, uh, the uh, requirements regarding port waste management planning, there are also in this directive, there are uh, elements that are uh, meant to be mandatory uh, so uh, they are they are to be put in uh, the plan, and uh, they are uh, a set an assessment of the need for port reception facilities, considering the needs of the ships that are normally visiting the port. There should be a description of the type and capacity of the port reception facilities, uh, a description of the procedures for the reception and collection of the waste a description of the cost recovery system, a description of the uh, procedure for reporting alleged inadequacies, uh, a description of the procedure for consultations with all the stakeholders, and finally also uh, an overview of the types and quantities of waste receipts received from ships uh, and handled in the facilities in the previous years. Um, so this is well, this is uh, an important uh, piece of uh, information for developing port waste management plans in, uh, of course, especially in uh, EU ports. And then there are some optional elements. Uh, well, you, you see them here: an overview of the uh, regulatory framework, um, an identification of a point of contact in the port 
that you can call when there's whatever problem related to the uh, delivery or collection of waste from ships. Uh, a description of pre-treatment -pre -pre equipment, if there are any uh, in the port. Um, and then a description of methods for recording the actual use of the reception facility. Now this is also done electronically by using the waste delivery receipts. Uh, also the amounts of waste delivery by ships that is uh, actually linked to the use of the port reception facility, as I just said, and also the, like a general overview of managing the different waste streams uh, in the port. Furthermore, taking a look at the time, okay, I think we are good. Um, yeah, so as I said, it is really the, the directive also provides specific information regards the ongoing consultations because from the experience with the previous directive, it has shown that this, these consultations are really essential. So the directive requires that this consultation should include, uh, I mean, the, the, the parties that are to be included are the port users or their representatives and where appropriate local uh, competent authorities the reception facility operators uh, organizations that are uh, linked to extended producer responsibility obligations um, extended producer responsibility is uh, also a tool that is being used in the eu for several years now uh, for example uh, when you buy a, a dishwasher then you have to pay an, uh, a certain waste fee but in return you can deliver or the the the, the seller of the dishwasher is uh, is uh, required to take the old one uh, free of charge so that is the extended producer responsibility it works with different types of uh, of products with batteries cars um, yeah electronic uh, devices and so on and finally, also, uh, as a stakeholder, you can uh, consult the representatives of civil society when appropriate, of course. This is for the, uh, the port authority to decide. Um, consul these consultations should not only be held when the plan is being drafted, but also after the adoption and so when the plan is uh, being implemented uh, there is the, also a, a clear requirement for having these consultations, especially also when there are significant changes in the operation of the port. Uh, it's very useful to consult everyone. Um, the directive also uh, opens the possibility to have port waste management plans developed by several ports. Uh, in the same geographical region. Um, we have some examples of that. Uh, for example, the, we have uh, the uh, North Sea port, which is actually three ports, the port of Ghent in Belgium and the ports of Flushing and Terneuzen in the Netherlands. So there's uh, one port authority in two different countries. Um, so there is a possibility to have one port waste management plan for these uh, three uh, ports. Um, there is also one in Scandinavia with uh, Copenhagen and uh, Malmö. Also two ports in two different countries, but one port uh, authority. Um, and then finally, uh, these port waste management plans are to be evaluated and approved. Uh, so there is always a competent authority who has to um, uh, yeah, explicitly approve these uh, these plans. In uh, in in Belgium, it is being uh, approved by the Minister of the Environment, um, and it should be uh, evaluated or reapproved every five years. Um, or also when there are significant changes in the operation of the port. What is a significant change? That is also up to the competent authority to decide. Uh, can be that 
there is a new dock being opened in uh, a port or a new terminal which really impacts the the general operation of the port so then you need a new plan um maybe we can because we have scheduled uh, a short break now this is i can stop with this slide and then we can have a short break uh, i uh with within the legal and policy framework i also uh wanted to refer to this iso uh, iso standard uh, on arrangement and management of port reception facilities i know iso standards are in a way not really a, a policy framework but I think this standard is really useful. Uh, this standard was meant to complement the, the ISO 14001, which is a, a very common uh, standard used in uh, environmental compliance. Uh, so, but this uh, standard added a specific port uh, component there, so which made, made it easier for ports to, or port operators or, uh, or private companies within a port to get this uh, ISO 14001. Um, it also and it also provides uh, a specific methodology regarding port waste management planning. Um, so that, that also may be useful to refer to this or take a look into this uh, ISO standard uh, 16304 because you also find some uh, elements of a port waste management plan in that um, in that standard ISO standard. Uh, Ada and uh, Tamara, shall we uh, have a short break now, maybe? Um, yeah, 10 yeah. minutes or 15 minutes? Yeah, uh, because 10, 15 we are, we are, minutes. Mm -hmm. OK, because we are on time and, and I think uh, we should. Uh, maybe any should questions? Maybe there are uh, yeah. questions. Yeah, good, were good suggestion. There were two questions. Ah, okay. one, one is from Adunis Tafangi from Madagascar. He asked if the port uh, waste management part, uh, port regulations, um, where is, uh, oh, yeah, is the port waste management plan uh, part of the port regulations or has it to be separated? Uh, it can work both ways. It, uh, in, in, uh, it is, in, in Belgium at least, it is a separate document. Uh, but it can be designed that it makes part of port regulations in general, because uh, port, you have port regulations on many shipping related issues, on ballast water, on degassing or on uh, uh, terminal operations and whatever. Uh, but it, you, you can make the, the port waste management plan as a separate document, but linked to that to those port regulations. If they because if you make the port waste management plan a legally binding document, then in a way it is it works as a as a port regulation. Adonis, has this answered your question? Yes, very good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there's another one from Carolina Carlos from Timor-Leste. She said, uh, dear Peter, could you please provide priority action to be taken on how to manage new port facilities? Uh, for your information, Tibar Bay port are just officially run within eight months. We are planning to set our recycling plan in the facility. What is the most important point to be aware for establishing recycling area away from restricted area before subcontractor come and collect our, collect our segregated waste. That is a really specific question, <laughs> but uh, what I would answer to that question is that really because the question is about treating. It's not about the collection of the waste from the ships, but about the treatment options, which is of course. Uh, very important because uh, if and I have seen this in 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 other ports, uh, for example, if the 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 if the, the the treatment options like recycling or incinerating or whatever is too far away from from the port, then this has an impact also on on the cost to begin with because you if you need to drive a few one a few hundred kilometers uh, from outside the port. To have the waste being treated, 
the, the, that has an impact on the cost uh, to begin with. Uh, and it will also affect operations because yeah, you will have to spend uh, more um, uh, efforts on, on transporting and so on. And that is not really the, the, uh, the, the core business of a reception facility. So I would say that if you are thinking about uh, investing in recycling facilities, then it can be, of course, outside the port area, but not too far. And another uh, element is that it also depends on the volume of the, the type of waste that is being recycled. Um, and, and also the, uh, the municipality or cities that, that are surrounding uh, the port, because if we speak about garbage, for example, from ships, well, the garbage from a ship is not that much different from household waste. So if you put these two together, the household waste from the municipality or the city and the garbage from the ship, well, it increases the, the volume and, and can improve cost efficiency of the, the treatment. So uh, that, those are a few elements uh, to take into account, I, I would say. And also, uh, I, I would think that a question like that is something to be addressed in a, a, a national or a regional waste management strategy. So not only seeing it for the, the shipping side or but but really seeing it as a, a general waste management uh, issue. Has this I hope, yeah, <laughs> I hope this is a good answer to the, to the question because it's it's a rather specific one. Okay. Are there any more questions? Uh, Carolina, has this answered your question? Uh, loud and clear, merci. <laughs> thank you. Peter, thank you everyone to, uh, for being back. Um, appreciate your interest. Peter, let's continue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. Just one thing I noticed now the, the questions that were in the chat uh, area. So I missed something from the, uh, the, the Senegal uh, question. I think it's a, a very good one because it refers to cleaning of the national uh, seabeds um, and the, the seagrass uh, beds. So uh, actually, I just wanted to add that in, in several countries in Europe, we have a project that is more or less similar. It's called Fishing for Litter. So that is actually a, a program where uh, fishermen, especially uh, bottom trawlers, uh, where so they, they fish on the, the, the seabed. And of course, they don't only catch, they do not only catch fish, but they also uh, bring up um, litter from the, 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 the seabed. And uh, we have this, this program where the fishermen that participate in this uh, in, in this uh, program can deliver this waste free of charge. So they are given these big bags and uh, they can use these big bags when they return to their home port. Uh, they can just put it on the on the shore side, on the, the case side, and then the bag is being collected by an, uh, a reception uh, facility. Uh, and this is subsidized by the government. So the, the type of waste is, I guess, very similar to the, the type of waste that you are um, getting with the, uh, the seagrass uh, beds cleanup. So just wanted to add that we have something more or less similar. Uh, there was one more slide in the previous part that I still had to uh, discuss. It's this one. Um, you should be seeing it, I guess. It's about the management of plastic waste from ships. Um, there is a, a specific section in, in the, the, the guidance manual on, on the management of plastic waste from ships. Well, in general, it, it's actually more about, you, you, it's, let's say you could broaden this to all types of waste uh, from ships. 
Um, and the guidance document gives you specific information on the amounts of waste generated on board ships. For example, when uh, you are developing the waste management plan and you are uh, doing the assessment of the need for facilities, then there's not always information available on how much waste actually would be available in your port for uh, collection. And then there are some tools you can apply uh, trying to uh, calculate uh, uh, these amounts uh, of waste because, of course, they are impacting the, the need for the, the facility and, as a result, also the adequacy of uh, the facility. So in the, the, the guidance manual, there are some, <clears throat> some uh, theoretical tools. Um, for example, uh, if you have data from reception facilities and so on, and if you have data from uh, advanced notification schemes, for example, like the one in the cons IMO consolidated guidelines, then you already have a substantial part of uh, reliant uh, data. But sometimes that is not uh, available when you don't have these uh, data on previous years or, or collection of, of waste from ships, then there are more theoretical tools. And there is one for example, or I, I think there are two that I uh, included in the guidance document. Uh, the first one is uh, about uh, the uh, types of waste that are being generated on board of a ship and the, uh, the um, let's say, the, 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 uh, the generators, the, the, the elements that, that are influencing the, uh, the, the amount of uh, waste uh, on board the ship because there are there are sometimes there are treatment options on board like solidifiers or or uh, commuters or these compactors uh, or the ship can uh, apply uh, a sustainable purchase policy for example when the ship uh, when supplies are being delivered to the ship then they can have an agreement with the supplier that they also take back the packaging, uh, which uh, significantly reduces the amount of packaging material on board of the ship. Uh, so all these elements, they uh, impact the amount of waste uh, on board of the ship and also the amount of waste that is being delivered to a reception facility. And there is also in the guide, uh, guidance document um, information where you can calculate the uh, amount of waste depending on the type of the ship. So you have some examples there, uh, the number of persons uh, on board and the duration of uh, the voyage, because of course that also implement, uh, impacts the uh, waste generation significantly. So that are tools that can be used uh, for calculating the amount of waste to be delivered in your port. Uh, I also think uh, it is important to bear in mind the, the fishing gear. As I said uh, multiple times already, the fishing gear really is a, a, a big problem. Um, also, the issue of segregation of the garbage. Uh, there are recommendations for uh, segregating garbage in the Marple Annex 5 implementation guidelines, uh, which, of course, segregation of waste um, facilitates recycling options. Um, so that is also an important issue. And then finally, uh, I, I wanted to refer to the waste uh, hierarchy uh, when it comes to treatment uh, options. Um, and fi yeah, well, final disposal is uh, is something that still happens a lot, uh, but uh, is not really preferable. Um, and especially uh, recycling, or at as a minimum, uh, incineration with uh, energy recovery is uh, more uh, preferable. So. Um, yeah, that's, that is what I wanted to say about this uh, last issue. 
Um, yeah, and in the, the guidance document, there are also several uh, references to the, the prevention and recycling options, ways to energy, uh, etc. And also to the, uh, the, the issue of passively fished waste, which I also mentioned in, uh, in, uh, when answering the, the question from uh, Senegal there. Um, so that is more or less uh, similar. So, okay, I will now go to part three of the uh, presentation. Peter, is it possible yes. to to widen the um, your presentation? Yes, it's you not, don't it's, see it. It's it's not showing as it should. Okay, I will stop Unless again then. At least in my in my. Uh, no. Sorry. Just a second. Part three. No, it's okay now. Yeah. Ah, okay, good. So now this this uh, third part actually uh, is, yeah, you can say this is the main part or the, the most important part from um, from the the whole webinar, uh, because now we really dig into the elements of uh, a port waste management plan. Um, so I, actually, what I'm going to do is talk you through the the uh, the elements that are. Uh, also in the uh, guidance uh, manual. So, well, yeah, again, uh, as uh, bearing in mind uh, the purpose of a port waste management plan, which is to improve availability, adequacy, and usage of the port reception facility. Also, the key elements of a port waste management plan are also directly linked to the elements that uh, are uh, uh, impacting the availability, adequacy, and usage of the facility. So you have uh, the number and types of the ships that, uh, that call the port, uh, the waste management requirements of each type of ship. I mean that uh, for a, a marina or a recreational port, uh, where only uh, yachts uh, are calling, require a different approach than a port with uh, a chemical industry, for example, or, or dry bullock or, or, or cruise. Just, uh, uh, of course, this also impacts the type of reception facilities you need in the port. And also the, uh, the other ports characteristics, the, the size, uh, a, a big port is, is in a way similar to when it comes to traffic. The, the, the amount doesn't make a difference regarding the types of waste, but there is a difference regarding the, the amount of waste. Uh, and then again, it has an impact on cost efficiency of uh, treatment options and et cetera. Uh, also, uh, yeah, um, there are some additional considerations to uh, take into account uh, when it comes to waste management planning. For example, technological challenges. Uh, the question that was asked previously about a recycling uh, facility, that is something that uh, is to be taken into consideration uh, when developing a waste management plan. Um, uh, for example, also, if you have a port in an industrialized area where there's a lot of land-based uh, facilities and, and, and industry, in general, there is already a lot of waste management uh, infrastructure in those uh, uh, industrialized areas available, which can also be used in in the port. So that can all uh, th that will also influence the uh, development of a port waste management plan. Also, uh, issues related to the local waste policy uh, will impact the port waste management planning. Uh, as I said, local regulations, local strategies, <coughs> etc., can be uh, issues that uh, also uh, uh, affect, have an effect on waste from ships. And in that case, they should be uh, taken on board of the waste management plan uh, as well. 
specific geographic situations. Uh, the, I, I put here the example of the, the SITs, the small island development states, uh, also the Arctic. Uh, these are two uh, specific uh, geographic situations where also uh, Marco has uh, foreseen possibility to address uh, waste management or provision of uh, port reception facilities on a regional scale. So that is uh, also uh, possible where not every port needs to have, let's say, the full scale of uh, reception capacity or whatever, but this capacity can be reached on a, a, re a regional uh, scale. Also, the, um, the special areas, for example, they also uh, impact the need for reception facilities and as a result, also the waste management planning. Um, now there is, uh, I think from 2025, there is a new special area. Uh, it, is it the, the Persian, uh, the, the, the Red Sea or the, the, the Persian Sea and the Gulf area there? I think um, um, there is a new special area for Marple Annex 5. So uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the countries in that area, the Marple, uh, the parties to Marple in that area, to Marple Annex 5, they will have to look into the, maybe an increased need for reception facilities because in special areas, discharge requirements are more strict than in non-special areas which may lead to uh, 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 a higher need for uh, reception capacity. Uh, specific port characteristics may also impact uh, the need for reception facility. For example, uh, seasonal impacts like cruise, uh, they, they are general uh, cruise uh, or cruise ships calling the port are linked with the tourist season so you can have that uh, the, the case that in uh, winter time for example there is less uh, 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 not as big need for reception capacity than in than during tourist uh, season and then finally also the question which i so, or, or an issue that i already started uh, with uh, in the beginning of the the presentation is what is how do you see the port waste management plan do you see it as something that is a, a, a requirement a legal requirement that is to be fulfilled or do you really see it as a, a full compendium where all the information is uh, collected and as a result it can be used like a, a full guidance document so this also will have uh, an impact on the development of the plan uh, and then we go to the uh, to the elements uh, because I will make a distinction between really basic elements that in my view are to be a part of every port waste management plan and other elements that can be seen as optional uh, so but we will discuss that later the first big question also uh, is to uh, who is to draft the port waste management plan uh, actually this can differ from one country to another um, and but in in principle it has to be decided by the competent national uh, authority so um, in uh, uh, yeah so the the national competent authority is to uh, put it in, in the national regulatory framework, which procedures are uh, related to the development and also approval and renewal of the Port Waste Management Plan, and also who is to draft the Port Waste Management Plan. And also this, this can differ. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in here in Belgium, we have for the merchant seaports, Clearly, it is in our regulations that the port authorities are to develop the port waste management plans. But for uh, recreational ports, for example, the, uh, the, the, the system is somewhat different because we don't always have like a port authority for recreational ports, but it's the, the, the uh, yacht clubs actually. So the, 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 um, the organizations that operate the, the, the recreational port 
are to uh, develop a port waste management plan. Uh, for fishing ports, again, it's even different. So really, it's, uh, it depends on the national situation, uh, and it has to be made clear and, and to be decided by the uh, competent uh, national authority. It can be the maritime authority, can be the environmental authority, or uh, the authority responsible for port uh, policy, etc. Uh, and also, uh, as I said, in like in, in Belgium, for example, uh, we make distinction between the type of uh, the port, because sometimes in a port, and, and, and again, this depends on the way how the port is organized or the, um, yeah, within the uh, organizational, national organization, how the, the ports are organized. You can have the case that there are independent entities within a certain port. So for example, uh, in Belgium, we have uh, several ports where the merchant seaport, the, there's also a fishing port and a recreational port within the same port area, but each of the three, they are uh, considered to be independent areas. So there are three port waste management plans. There is one for the, the, the merchant seaport area. There is a separate one for the fishing port. And there is uh, another separate one for the recreational port. So each of these independently managed areas uh, can also be a, a, like a terminal, for example. Uh, so they uh, can draft their own plans. Now, looking at the, the, the specific elements of a port waste management plan, as I said, and we have seen it uh, already several times, that addressing the adequacy of a reception facility, it is a rather complex issue. There are many, uh, many elements that, that impact the adequacy. So also the, the elements that you have in a port are linked to this uh, uh, adequacy issue are also uh, co uh, complex and, and can be very uh, difficult or different. Um, so uh, yeah, well, we have discussed this, the, the ports and port users characteristics can change very much between different ports. Uh, also the, the, the legal framework can be different. Uh, the policy ambitions, whether you have specific waste management or recycling targets, for example. Um, and also the uh, existing waste management infrastructure within and in the vicinity uh, of the port. All these elements uh, make it uh, or have an impact on the port waste management plan. So either uh, you can say if we go, if we decide to have this full uh, port waste management plan, to have this compendium of uh, information, um, of data, of procedures and etc. Well, it can be uh, a, a, a huge task, really, uh, to uh, to develop a port based management like that. Uh, it can also be very costly if you have to hire uh, additional staff, etc. So it uh, it may not always be uh, the preferred option. Uh, and an alternative in that case is to just take out a few essential elements that are really uh, forming the uh, a basic uh, port waste management plans. So in the guidance uh, document, you will see that uh, there is clearly a distinction being made between the, the key elements of a basic port waste management plan and some of the more optional uh, elements. And now I will talk you through the, uh, the elements, the, the, the key elements of uh, a basic port waste management plan. So uh, just uh, an overview here, and then we will go more into detail. So in, in, in our view, the basic elements are the purpose uh, of the port waste management plan, the scope of the port waste management plan, uh, an overview of available port waste management plans, uh, sorry, port reception facilities, and here you can make, as I also said, you can make a link with the IMO GISIS uh, database. Uh, 
Uh, also, the assessment of the need for additional port reception facilities. This is really an important element. And then uh, procedures related to the delivery and the collection, such as the advanced waste notification, uh, the, the use of waste delivery receipt, and in both, uh, both documents, the, the plan should contain information about what information is to be uh, exchanged and who, who has to do what, etc. Also, the cost recovery system, when you have one in your port, this is really an, an, an important element. Stakeholder consultations, it's always the same. I, I, I repeat this because it's really so important. And also, uh, uh, the reporting of alleged inadequacies is, is really an important element. So talking about the purpose of the Port Waste Management Plan, again, it's to improve availability, adequacy and usage of the port reception facility for the waste from ships normally calling the port, again, important, um, in order to protect the marine environment by reducing discharges into the sea of waste from ships, and that it also includes cargo residues. It's always useful to have clearly have this purpose mentioned in the Port Waste Management Plan to make it clear what is this all about uh, and, and, and what's the main goal. So its objectives are to reduce illegal discharge of waste from, vessel, from vessels, to comply with legal duties uh, regarding waste management, to consult with all the, the, the stakeholders and, and uh, the users uh, of the port, um, to prevent the production of waste wherever possible, and to reuse or recycle waste wherever possible. Of course, as I said, this is not carved in stone, eh? so it really depends on, on your, your national situation, uh, on the ambition level of the, the plan, uh, on the available facilities, uh, etc. So, but I think in in any case, when developing a port waste management plan, it is important to make sure of its purpose. A second a very important element of the plan, in in my view, is the scope. Uh, it is really essential to 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 make clear, first of all, to which vessels the the port waste management applies, and as a result of course, also to, to which not. Um, so, uh, and also the port's geographical and juridical boundaries. Um, when talking about the types of vessels, it is important to, to mention because sometimes, eh, I gave the example already from the, the three different ports uh, or the three different types of vessels within the same port area with the merchant seaport, the fishing port and the recreational port. So if you develop a plan, you have to make clear to which vessels uh, the, the, the plan applies. Sometimes specific types of shipping are excluded. Uh, of course, we have the warships, which is very commonly uh, used in, in all types of uh, uh, IMO uh, 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 regulatory framework. So it makes sense that uh, if warships are excluded, that also in the port waste management plan, it is clear that warships are not included. But sometimes there can be other types of shipping, for example, inland navigation. Uh, we have in, uh, in Western Europe a specific regulation uh, or it's a, a convention on waste from inland shipping with a, a total different approach uh, differing from seagoing vessels. So clearly also in the plan, we have made a distinction saying inland navigation is not within the scope of, uh, of, of the, the plan. Um, ships that are government owned uh, are excluded, for example. So you really you can... Uh, you can make a, a, a you, you can yeah make a tailor-made port waste management plan for your port, um, and then uh, regarding the the port's jurisdiction, um, sometimes it is uh, there are private terminals or, or jetties or military uh, infrastructure 
uh, where you say, okay, these are outside uh, the port's jurisdiction. So we clearly uh, take these elements out of the plan. Uh, another uh, issue sometimes uh, is anchor or anchorages. Uh, sometimes vessels are too big to uh, come into a port um, and uh, they make use of anchorages. Uh, sometimes the anchorages make part of the port's jurisdiction. So then it is also important to, to clearly mention this in the uh, in the scope of the port waste management plan as well. Sometimes anchorages when they are outside the port jurisdiction, then again, this uh, is um, to be, this is an important information to have uh, in the plan. Um, yeah, of course, the overview of available reception facilities, obviously <laughs> that's, uh, should be there in uh, a port waste management plan, uh, a contact list uh, of all the the uh, available facilities, a short description and an indication of their capacity. And again, you can use the GISIS database uh, for this, but it's not uh, necessary. Uh, and then also if there are specific uh, issues related to the availability of the facility, for example, yeah, pumping capacity uh, or opening hours or whatever can be essential or, or necessary information, then this is to be put in the overview as well. And then linked to the, uh, uh, the, the information of available reception facilities, there's also uh, the assessment of the need for additional reception facilities or even you can call it differently, an assessment of the adequacy of the existing facilities. That, uh, that is really uh, an important element there. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I explained this a little bit uh, already when speaking about the, uh, plastic, the, the uh, plastic waste uh, management. So when you, uh, an assessment like this is not easy. It's a, it's a, a rather difficult uh, exercise uh, because you don't always have the information uh, necessary to be able to do this uh, assessment. So you can use information um, on waste collection uh, and treatment from previous years, for example. Um, if you don't have it, uh, you can ask the waste contractors themselves whether they have useful uh, data. Um, in many countries, uh, port uh, or uh, waste infrastructure operators in general, not only uh, ship, uh, of course, or port uh, linked, but in general, they have a requirement to keep uh, like a register with uh, information. Um, so that can uh, be used uh, with the, the, in the register, there is the information about uh, waste collection, how much, what type of waste, the dates, etc. So that, um, that can be used. And uh, as said, is, if this is not available, you can always have the theoretical models, uh, which I also refer to based on the ship types, the crews, the uh, onboard treatment options, and voyage duration, but this, this, these uh, theoretical models are um, sometimes, uh, let's say, not that reliable or or not that specific. But it still, if if nothing else is available, then then they can be uh, useful. Uh, and then also, as I already mentioned, the uh, special area. Uh, if uh, they are, if, if your port is uh, uh, in a special area for either one of the annexes, one, uh, four, five or six, uh, that can have an impact on the uh, availability or on the need for reception uh, facility. Another element, or should I say elements that are uh, uh, important in a basic port waste management plan are all the procedures that are related to the delivery and collection. Um, 
as uh, mentioned already, the advanced waste notification is uh, something that is uh, important. This is uh, in the consolidated guidelines uh, of the IMO. And there you have the uh, a format uh, which information is uh, necessary. Uh, you uh, in and also in the plan, then you have to provide information about the, the timing when does a, a ship or a ship agent uh, need to notify this uh, information? How is it to be done? Uh, is it to be done with a, a fax or uh, uh, electronically or email or whatever? So that should also be specified in the plan. Of course, who is to do it? Uh, to whom? Uh, in, in, in some cases, for example, this advanced waste notification is to be sent to the harbor master's office, but in other cases, it can be the environmental department or whatever. Uh, it, it really depends. And actually also, the, uh, the, 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 how this advanced waste notification is being used in some ports, this is only uh, indicative. It works like some kind of uh, information from the ship to the, 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 the port. But in other ports, uh, an advanced notification already works as a request for collection. So uh, when an advanced waste notification is uh, received, then you have already the information from the ship about which types of waste the ship has on board, how much waste the ship has on board, and how much the ship wants to deliver to the reception facility. So, and that is important information to organize the collection of, um, of the waste from the ship. And also the timing is important in this case, uh, according to the IMO consolidated guidelines, I think there's a reference to at least 24 hours before the ship calls uh, the port uh, so that the, uh, the reception facility has the opportunity to organize the, the collection. And in the EU directive, for example, this really the deadline is 24 hours before calling uh, the port. Uh, and then the same works for the waste delivery receipt. This is also based on the IMO consolidated guidelines. Uh, there you have the information about the exact collection of the, the ship. So how much uh, and which types of waste did the ship deliver to the reception facility? Um, and then in the port waste management plan, it is again uh, to, uh, to specify how, which format is to be used, uh, who, yeah, well, in general, it is the, the reception facility who has to complete the form uh, and how it is to be transferred to who is collecting the information. Can be the port authority again, can be uh, the environmental department, can be both. Um, and when uh, is this to be uh, uh, transferred? Um, in, in Europe, it's, uh, it's not specified really, because uh, I mean, it's not specified when this waste delivery receipt has to be transferred because it depends on the, the uh, um, in, in, in most cases, the waste, is going to uh, a, a, um, a treatment or to uh, a, re, uh, a recycling facility where they segregate the waste in different types, and then they, yeah, it depends on when this uh, segregation is being done, uh, and so it can take a few time, a few days, even sometimes uh, a week before this information is uh, is available, and then a third. Uh, let's say procedure, uh, which is a, a key element in the plan, of course, when it is available in the, or when it is being used in the port is the cost recovery system. Um, it is mentioned in, when it comes to the adequacy uh, issues that the cost for waste delivery can work as a disincentive. So an indirect cost recovery system can take away the economic advantage of discharging into the sea. Um, yeah, that, that's what I also explained earlier. If a ship has to pay a fee anyway, even if it doesn't use the facility, then um, 
well in most cases the 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 mindset is that the the the, the that the ship delivers anyway so that is a good thing um also you can say that by using this indirect uh, fee system that the cost for providing uh, a port reception facility and operating the, re the reception facility is divided over all the port users. So it's really uh, only a small amount of, of the, the, the it's, it's not a, a big part of the total cost for the ship calling a port. The, uh, the, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the indirect waste fee, it's only a, a very small percentage of the total cost for, for a ship calling the port. So, and if in return there is uh, there are adequate facilities and there's a good service level and so on, then really ships will use the, the facilities. We have seen this in 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 EU since the beginning of the uh, the previous directive. Uh, you see here that uh, the uh, the graph here on, on the right. This is uh, the volume of waste from ships that is being delivered in the three major ports in, in Belgium. And you see, we started actually, so the, the first EU directive was in 2000, and we member states had two years time to implement it. So let's say that we started to have uh, relevant data in 2004. And you can see that this the, the amount of waste that was delivered has increased significantly uh, over the following years. And then there was a, a short drop down in uh, 2008, 2009, due to the global financial uh, crisis, but then it went up again. And then there was another drop down in 2015, 2016, but you can see that this is uh, the, the blue, uh, the blue lines here are uh, Marple and X1 waste, so uh, oily waste, liquid oily waste, sludge and bilges, and this drop down was uh, uh, due to more strict fuel requirements in uh, the, the North Sea. Uh, and that, uh, as a result, more ships uh, used uh, like um, marine gas oil and diesel, and, and they didn't generate as much sludge anymore. So that's, this, is also, this also affected uh, the delivery, of course, to port reception facilities of Marple Annex 1. But for the other annexes, it, it still uh, went up. So clearly it's, and, and also uh, uh, audits in, uh, in EU member states clearly indicated that the, this uh, cost recovery system has uh, impacted the delivery. Um, and also when there is more waste, you can, you can say as a port, but we don't want this waste because it's, it's really difficult for us uh, and it's an extra cost, but sometimes uh, more waste being delivered is being seen as a business opportunity for private waste contractors and in those cases it will be the the private uh, companies that will invest in facilities and and collection capacity so it is not for the port authority or the national authority to do it so that uh, may be also something to to bear in mind um, and then the stakeholder consultations, uh, as said, it is really a key success factor because a constructive dialogue between the, the, the port authority or whoever uh, drafts the, the port waste management plan and all the uh, relevant stakeholders is really crucial. Um, and uh, not only during the development of the plan, but if equally important during the uh, implementation and then the port waste management plan can include procedures organizing these stakeholder consultations um, for example in in our uh, ports we have this uh, this uh, requirement in the plan that uh, the the um, all stakeholders should be uh, consulted in a during a meeting so a physical meeting uh, at least three times per year so, and it really turned out that, that these meetings are useful. So who is at these meetings? It's uh, the, uh, the competent national authority. In our case, it's the environmental uh, agency. Uh, it's the port authorities. It's the uh, waste collectors, uh, the, the reception facilities, 
and also the shipping inspectorate uh, is uh, always at those meetings. Um, so this is, and, and there's really an, an open uh, discussion always. Uh, so it really has turned out uh, to be to be essential, really, in the success of uh, the, the the whole uh, waste management uh, system. Looking at the time, okay, nearly there. And then uh, finally, also in the basic port waste management plan, it is important to include a system for reporting alleged inadequacies. Because it's really important to have these, this information, because as a port authority, sometimes you, 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 you don't always know about inadequacies. Uh, and it, it is only being uh, highlighted or, or signaled uh, when, when uh, a ship is uh, reporting something that may not be correct or, or may not be uh, fully uh, in line with, uh, with the requirements. Um, so the IMO has also see, foreseen uh, in the consolidated guidance um, a format for reporting alleged inadequacies. Um, and it is useful to embed a procedure for this in the port waste management plan. Normally in uh, the, uh, let's say the IMO system, if a ship uh, is, in, uh, is uh, having difficulties uh, when delivering uh, waste, uh, to a reception facility, they complete the form, the, the IMO form, they send it to their flag state. Uh, the flag state sends the information to the IMO secretariat, and then the IMO secretariat forwards this uh, report to the coast state uh, or the, the port state. Um, and then it is up to the port state to investigate this, to see what, what, what was exactly the problem, uh, what went wrong, um, etc. And then the, the port state also has the possibility to provide an answer uh, to the, the IMO secretariat. And then this uh, information is also being uh, completed in the GISIS uh, database, where you have a section on reports of um, uh, alleged inadequacies. And then you have there all the information, including the response of the, the port state. Um, so it, it is uh, really useful also to make a reference to this procedure in the port waste management plan. And in addition, as a port authority, for example, you can add a, also a direct uh, or, or a possibility to directly report this uh, alleged inadequacy to the port authority. Although we have this included in the plan, but we have never had uh, a ship reporting directly to the port authority, a problem with the reception facilities or a non-adequacy of the reception facilities. This may be, of course, that, uh, that this may mean that our reception facilities all are fully adequate. However, I think that the reason for it is that ships or ships agents are not very keen on, comp uh, on um, complaining directly to the port authority uh, in the port they are working in on a daily basis. But still, uh, it is uh, useful to have it in the plan. And then there are some so-called optional elements um, of a port waste management plan. Uh, I can I did not provide any specific information in this presentation, but it's all in the, the guidance uh, document. Uh, for example, a brief description of the port is something that is uh, useful in the, the plan, especially when the plan is being used as a, a compendium with uh, all the information available. Um, an overview of definitions. Uh, it, it, I, I had some doubts whether this could be even uh, a basic element uh, or an, an essential element in, in a basic plan. Um, but again, this depends on, on the national situation or the, the local situation. Uh, for, for example, uh, uh, definitions can be uh, clarifying ship types or waste types um, 
or for example there's also in the 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 the, the another bullet there on exemptions uh where ships for example ferries or other ships that are in a uh a, a, a strict schedule uh that are frequently calling uh, your port you can have exemptions for those types of ships well it can be useful to include in the definitions for example what is a frequent caller uh in 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 eu uh, it is uh, a ship that is calling the same port at least once every two weeks but you you can make it differently you can you can say that uh it's a frequent caller is a ship that calls or is to call your port at least one time a week for example so therefore for issues like that it may be useful to have some definitions there which in order to avoid discussion afterwards when uh, implementing the plan also an overview of the regulatory framework may be useful in the plan uh, because not every stakeholder is uh, aware of all the uh legal requirements related to waste from ships because there are different angles there you have the the, the maritime uh regulatory framework and marpole and and all that is uh, linked to that you also have land-based uh regulatory framework for waste uh management uh, how how is waste to be treated do you need specific permits uh how about collection and transporting the waste uh, you, you need ide identification forms etc etc uh, so then when you put all this in your plan and you don't need to put all the legal text in the plan because then sometimes you end up with uh, over 100 pages and that's not necessary of course but at least you can include a reference to where you can find this uh, this information about the regulations some um, uh, references to record keeping uh, may be useful uh, as said um, reception facilities it's, it's uh, as a port authority it's important to have that you have the uh, re uh, relevant and reliant uh, information about how much waste is being collected and so on and which types of waste so you can put in the plan some requirements for the the, the, the waste contractors that they that they do a good record keeping, that they have registers and and uh, uh, record books and so on, in order to uh, be able to use this uh, information not only for statistics but really for assessing the adequacy of the facilities. Uh, exemptions. If you apply such a scheme, then of course it makes sense to to put it in uh, the plan. And finally, also the the monitoring and and enforcement. Uh, the monitoring. Well, for enforcement is, of course, very uh, specific, depends also on the uh, operation of the port authority, because sometimes uh, port authorities are more privately oriented and, uh, and enforcement may not always be, uh, let's say, high on, on the agenda. But in other cases, the uh, port authorities can do a lot of enforcement or, or also have an important task when it comes to enforcement. Uh, and then this should also be referred in uh, the plan and monitoring that is uh, more to do with uh, having well having the, the the correct information also for example in in, in our ports we have uh, everything is being done electronically so there's no um, paperwork being exchanged and so on um, and then it is important to have this in the plan also who has to do what uh, who is to uh, report information to which database etc so clearly again this this is the last the last slide of this uh, third part uh, again I, I would like to repeat that this is not carved in stone this is not uh, strict uh, to be applied strictly uh, this is all information that you can process and, and digest and, and pick out the things that are useful in your uh, port. So this is the end of, uh, of part three. We are still uh, on track, I think. Uh, I only have one more presentation, which is rather short compared to the, to the, the previous ones. So I suggest that um, I go on with the, this last part, 
and then we should have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers. If that is okay, I will continue. Yes, please, uh, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Is it again? Yes. Ah, okay. Okay, so one last effort uh, also for the translators. Uh, thank you for being so uh, patient uh, with me. Um, so there are a few more issues I would like to point, or, uh, yeah, point out. Uh, so uh, one of them is, uh, I call it flanking policy measures. Um, what I mean is that uh, waste from ships is, is not only to be seen as, as a very uh, specific waste type of waste or waste stream that is to be kept separate from all uh, other waste management issues. No, it's, it's rather the contrary. Uh, it is really important to integrate the, the, the management of waste from ships in, in a wider uh, waste management strategy. Um, and also in the, the, the guidance document, there are some elements addressing this. Uh, for example, when it comes to waste prevention and minimization, um, for ships, it's not always simple to, to prevent uh, or, or minimize uh, waste because they, well, they don't always have the uh, storage capacity, for example, to, 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 to separate, uh, separate different types of waste. Uh, they, they are, when supplies are being delivered, they don't, don't have always have an impact on the, the packaging, the waste package uh, and the waste from packaging that uh, comes from that, etc. But still there are some possibilities uh, and and then they should be or can be addressed in the in the, the plan as well. Uh, also, the waste hierarchy that is also something that in general is uh, included in national waste uh, management uh, strategies. So if they are uh, if they exist in your country, then it's also something to be taken into account in when developing. A port waste management plan. Um, yeah, addressing both ship and land generated waste. I also refer to this when answering the question from the first question. I, I can't remember where was it Madagascar. Um, so if you are um, if if you want to invest in a in a recycling facility or or in, a, in an incinerator, for example then the, the both land-based and ship-generated waste really it are to be put together because they will increase the volume, um, they will uh, facilitate cost-efficient treatment of, of, of waste. So that is uh, like also here an, an important uh, issue. Um, then also cooperation between ports for the provision of reception facilities. That's what I said when um, referring to the, the small island development states, for example, or the ports in the Arctic, uh, that it's not always, also for smaller ports, for example, it's not always necessary to invest in, in, uh, in uh, waste collection capacity for all types of waste. Um, I've seen it in, in the Caribbean, for example, there is a, a waste management, a regional waste management strategy where for cruise vessels, because they mainly, or in general, they have one home port where they go to, and then it's not always necessary to have full uh, capacity in all the other ports that are on the ship's uh, route. So this is uh, something to take into account. And in, in that case, it may be useful to cooperate between the ports when developing a port waste management plan. Um, the issue of circular economy that in a way is linked to the waste hierarchy and the waste prevention and minimization issue as well. So 
circular economy is uh, something that is on, I think, every uh, competent or environmental authorities agenda uh, these days. So more and more countries are uh, focusing on circular economy or, or, or developing strategies uh, facilitating circular economy. And uh, in that case, uh, it may be useful to refer to it in the Port Waste Management Plan as well. And then finally, uh, incentivizing the segregated delivery of waste. As said, uh, segregating waste in general uh, improves options for recycling. Um, Marpol does not have a strict requirement for segregating waste, although in the uh, guidelines, in the, the Marpol Annex 5 implementation guidelines, there is a uh, reference to segregating different types of waste. So, and, and even though it's not a strict requirement, in our ports, we still see that more and more ships are segregating their waste. Um, and then it, uh, but they don't always segregate it in the same way. So some uh, ship operators, they segregate several types of waste and then other ship operators, other types of waste. So it may be useful to, in, to, to, um, to, to streamline this in, in, uh, in your port. Uh, and then the port waste management plan may also be um, a useful tool. Uh, and then finally, yeah, regional port waste management plans. I also referred to that already. Another issue uh, that I also touched upon briefly is the approval and review uh, issue. As, as I said, it is preferable actually to make the plan a legally binding document because in that case, it's, uh, it works also as some kind of a, a, a port uh, regulation that also referred to one of the questions being asked. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it can be optional because it depends on, the, on, the, uh, on, on how it is organized in, in your country, it depends on the national regulatory framework. Um, it can also <coughs> depend on the, the type and size of the port. Uh, for example, if you uh, some Belgium is only a small country, but in other countries which are really big, with uh, hundreds or, or thousands of ports, from uh, big ones to the very small ones, maybe you can set up some kind of a threshold level, where you say that ports bigger than a minimum uh, size are to uh, have a port waste management plan, which should be. Uh, formally approved by whoever, competent authority or the minister or whatever. And ports that are below the threshold level, uh, small ports uh, or even recreational ports or whatever, it's, it's, uh, it all depends. You can say they uh, are to develop a port waste management plan, but it should not be uh, formally approved. Because, of course, if you have thousands of... Uh, recreational ports it's a lot of work for the administration as well and you don't always have the resources for that so um, for example in sweden in scandinavia they have this requirement that small uh, ports or jetties with only a few uh, vessels for example they need to have the plan available for inspection but it's not formally uh, approved uh, and then uh, who is to approve it it can be the maritime authority, can be the environmental authority. Again, this is up to the, the national situation. And then if it is uh, formally approved, then uh, in, in principle, there's also to be a revision or a reapproval process of the, the plan. So um, uh, the uh, assessment whether the plan is being implemented effectively. Well, in general, this is a, uh, an ongoing process. It's not something you do after three or four years. Uh, and also in this case, the stakeholder consultation process is extremely uh, important. Uh, of course, it's, it makes sense that the port waste management plan is to be kept up to date. So also here, if there are significant changes, 
then uh, the port waste management plan is to be uh, updated. Also, for example, the tariffs, if uh, uh, the, I mean the, the, the waste fee, uh, referring to the cost recovery system, uh, in, in general, these uh, in, indirect fees are to be reviewed on a yearly basis. So you should not always put it in the plan, but at least in an annex to the plan, because depending on the uh, formal approval process, it may be difficult uh, to, to, it may be a, a, a quite heavy uh, administrative process, but if it is in an annex, sometimes annexes can be amended rather easily. So uh, then it may be useful to, to put it uh, in, uh, in an annex. Uh, and then, yeah, when to do this, this review? Well, at least I would say every three or five, or th three to five years. Um, yeah, then I have in, in the guidance document also made a distinction between different types uh, of ports and you can use different models. Uh, for example, um, as I said, the sports characteristics, they can change uh, very much between ports. Uh, and they also impact uh, the uh, need for reception facilities and as a result also impact the development of the plans. Uh, we in, uh, in Belgium, and I see this in, in other countries as well, um, made distinction between four uh, types of, uh, of, of ports, uh, be, being the merchant seaports, the uh, passion, passenger and cruise ports, the fishing ports, and then finally the recreational ports and, and uh, marinas. Uh, so what we have done is we developed these basic uh, formats for the, the port waste management plan. And for each type of port, they all use the same um, model, uh, so to speak. And here you find an overview of the elements that are being used in uh, each of these models. So for merchant seaports, for example, well, it makes sense that uh, most of the issues that I uh, refer to in the basic port waste management plans are applicable to merchant seaports. The only, um, the only uh, exemption that I used here was the cost recovery system because not every port applies a cost recovery system. But I would say that all the other issues, the purpose, the scope is really important. The uh, available uh, reception facilities, of course, that is one of the most important elements together with the assessment. Advanced waste notification <coughs> and waste delivery seat, I put there as well because they are based on IMO guidelines. So therefore, I think uh, for merchant seaports, it's also important. And then stakeholder consultations, that is actually for each type of port uh, uh, very important. Also reporting of alleged inadequacies. Yeah, maybe for a, a marina or a fishing port, they are a little bit uh, uh, less important than in merchant seaports and, and cruise ports. But again, here also they, they are based on an IMO guideline. So I, I kept them in there. Uh, other ports, for example, Going to the to the other side of the of the the spectrum, uh, the marinas, of course, uh, advanced notification is uh, something that is not being used in uh, marinas. The same goes for waste delivery receipts because, in general, the uh, recep reception facilities in in recreational ports are like just open un unmanned uh, skips and and waste containers and so on. So there is there is no waste delivery receipt. So that is something that's not applicable. The same goes for fishing ports, uh, because in, in, well, in, in our experience, fishing vessels, they have a home port, which they go to uh, most of the time on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, also there, it is not always uh, uh, the, the, the advanced waste notification and the waste receipt are not always applied. Um, and then uh, the scope of the port waste management plan also for the, the marina, it's optional um, because in general, in a marina, it's very clear what the scope is 
it's the the, the yacht club and and uh, recreational vessels um i think we are nearly there yeah just to uh ah, two more slides this uh of course, you, probably you already have it, but uh, here you have uh, the link to uh, to the the the, uh, the web page where you can download the guidance document on Port Waste Management Plan. It's on the Glowlit uh, website. Um, and then one more thing, just as an example, in Belgian seaports, uh, how how did we do it uh, with uh, waste from uh, ships? Well, as said, we identified four target groups, merchant seaports, fishing ports, marinas, and also inland uh, navigation, inland terminals. But then I mean um, inland um, uh, terminals where seagoing vessels are uh, calling. But there's also a separate plan for inland navigation, which is under a total different scheme. Um, so we have made the tailor-made port waste management plans as as i said we have these uh, models that each of the ports uh, can use there are separate consultation fora so there is one uh, with the merchant seaports that we meet at least three times per year but we also have separate uh, consultation uh, moments with the fishing ports also with the marinas and uh not exactly with the inland terminals, but with the uh, inland waterways authority. So uh, we see them also on a, almost on a weekly basis. Um, yeah, we have also uh, an incentive based fee system. Um, this means that every ship calling a port pays a fee. Uh, this accounts for all types of ports, uh, from the largest uh, merchant seaports to small uh, recreational ports even. Of course, the fee differs. Uh, and then there's a, a full indirect fee for the, uh, the cost related to the collection and the treatment of garbage. So if uh, the, the waste fee is, uh, there is a distinction uh, between oily waste and garbage, and the fee fully covers the uh, the collection of the garbage. So there is no fee or no cost linked to the volume of uh, the waste. There's no limit uh, on, on the volume. Um, and then there is a, a fully uh, web-based uh, electronic reporting scheme, as I, as I also mentioned. So there's no paperwork for the, the, the stakeholders involved. As a result, we do have accurate statistics for several years now. And also automated cost checks, especially in the large ports, because, for example, the port of Antwerp, there are 15,000 ship calls per year. Uh, it's not possible to do this uh, on a case-by-case, on a case, uh, these, these checks. So they are also integrated in the, in the database. So if there is, for example, if the ship notifies in advance that it wants to deliver 10 cubic meters of, uh, of plastic waste. And uh, based on the, so that, that goes into the data system and also the waste delivery seat goes into the data system uh, from the reception facility. And if there is a, a difference more than it's 10%, I guess, or 15% between what the ship has notified and between what the port reception facility has notified, there is an, an automatic alarm being sent out to the port authority so they can see what what is the problem why did the ship deliver uh, less waste than it has uh, previously indicated uh, sometimes it can be that it's just a, a typo or whatever but sometimes there's also yeah a need for for an inspection really this is my last slide actually so uh, you have my contact details here as well um, in case if, if you would have additional questions we, we have now time for question and answers of course but if tomorrow maybe or next week or next month whenever you have a, an additional question you can uh, you, you can always contact me and uh, hopefully I can uh, answer your question okay Tamara the floor is yours
Thank you so much, Peter. Um, as always, very um, interesting and informative sessions that you run. Um, I would suggest we take questions now. I see some questions in the chat. Ada, if you could read out the questions yes. and Peter will try to answer them and then um, let's see how it goes. And I have a few remarks to make. Thank you. So Ninken van der Boek asked uh, if uh, you could please provide some examples of cost recovery systems for fishing ports. Uh, is this also done on the basis of indirect fee covering recovered um, slash waste nets? Yes, I see the question. Yes, it is uh, actually on a, on a, a same uh, way. Um, with an indirect fee, uh, but but for the garbage, we have a system with uh, indirect fees. Uh, in uh, in Belgian fishing ports, we have a system where there's a, a, the the uh, the Flemish fishing cooperative. So it's like a, a corporation of fishermen, and they organize waste collection from uh, from fishing uh, from fishing vessels. So it's a uh, for the, the large part, it's on a voluntary basis. So they organized a system with uh, a, a yearly fee. So it's not every time the ship calls the port because, as, as said, fishing vessels, they have a different way. They have a home port the, most of the time. Uh, they, they go there on a daily or on a weekly basis. So this is then organized on, on a yearly fee depending also on the size of the vessel. So we have made distinction between small fishing vessels, like the, 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 the coast uh, trawlers, which go for shrimp and so on, uh, and the, the large fishing vessels. Uh, so they pay a yearly fee, and in return uh, for the fee, if the ship calls the port, then, um, then uh, sorry, I got a little bit distracted. Um, then in return for that fee, they can deliver the fishing gear or the, the garbage in general free of charge. So it is organized by the, this, uh, this cooperation. Um, for oily waste, it's different. This, this is outside the scope of the, of the fee system. So if a fishing vessel wants to deliver oily waste, then the fishing cooperative can facilitate the collection, but th there is a direct fee uh, to be paid by the fishing vessel to the uh, to the reception facility for the oily waste, but for the garbage, it's all included in um, in a uh, uh, one hundred percent uh, indirect fee, but on a, on a yearly basis. And for a f this is for let's say ninety five percent of the the Belgian fishing fleet, for the five percent which are not uh, included in this uh, system. I must say we are still negotiating how to address these uh, because according to the EU directive, also these uh, ships have to pay this uh, this indirect fee. Um, but it's rather complicated, and 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 I must say we are still in the process of organizing this. I hope this is a, an answer to your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Ah, okay. Graag gedaan. Any other question? Please feel free to raise your hand. You have this opportunity to unmute yourself and raise your hand, please. There's no more questions. There are questions about the... PowerPoint slides. Um, the, they have been already in the chat. Um, Ada sent in a chat uh, their four sections as Peter presented, so four different presentations, both in English and French. Um, they were, but they will also be sent by email. Ada will send later by email. So these slides are available in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. So you'll have access to them. And you'll also have access to this um, recording, uh, should you, uh, would you, if you like to refer back to it. Um, any questions before we start closing? 
No, okay, excellent. That was a Peter. That apparently was very clear presentations, but <laughs> um, it's a lot. It's a lot to digest, also. I, mean. I know, I know, <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting. And what I want to uh, mention is that tomorrow we'll have another session, uh, but it will be a diff uh, different time. It will be from one p.m. to five p.m. Uh, British time, so Greenwich time. Um, and that will be interpreted to Spanish, just to meet the um, time zone of our Spanish-speaking countries. But also English speakers, please welcome, well, French speakers, please welcome to join again. You are very welcome to join as many sessions as you like, but it is the same content. Um, that will be also recorded for the future reference. Uh, what I wanted to say is, um, these are uh, webinars, meetings, uh, trainings that give you an introduction. What is the port waste management plan all about? What you need to consider, the details, and Peter really well walked us through uh, the main components and requirements. Now, Glolita Design has um, opportunity for the countries to receive support to develop their national port waste management plan. Plans. And next year, we under the uh, under the scope of Glolita, uh, we are able to select five countries that we support. We will support with developing port waste management plan. And Peter uh, kindly will lead that initiative. But it will be next year and most probably in 2025. So five in total for now. That's what uh, our budget and scope allows and timing as well. And the idea will be with uh, for Peter and um, IMO and FAO work together with national authorities uh, to uh, to go deeper into what's required for the uh, port waste management plan, how to do it and actually customize it for the requirements of the country and that specific port. That will be um, forthcoming uh, next year. And that's why it was important for to have um, our counterparts and stakeholders from um, ports and uh, shipping and fisheries authority to have this introductory um, sessions with Peter. That's uh, it for me. I would appreciate. I, I I really appreciate your timing, um, Peter. Of course, um, as always, uh, pleasure to listen to your sessions. Um, our countries, our partnering countries, our lead partner countries for joining this session. As always, we look forward to partnering with you uh, on different topics related to sea-based marine plastic litter. Um, Ada, appreciate your support to run this uh, session smoothly. And very important, uh, thank you our interpreters. Um, I hope it went well. I was listening, trying to understand. I'm, uh, what I can understand, it went very well. Um, and I look forward to meeting you again tomorrow or um, and new participants as well. Any final comments, Peter? Thank you from my side as well, and especially also the, the interpreters uh, for, for bearing with me and also to the uh, participants for your interest. And I wish you all good luck with the uh, development of uh, port waste management plans. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.